they're just squeezing everything even harder and harder from one workout to the next without even realizing it. So they're not making the body part work any harder. But if you keep changing up your technique and your exercises without thinking too much about how much weight you're using, about the attention time and the reps and being so focused on that, as opposed to thinking about the training experience, the results are very different. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. This podcast is brought to you by Vital Exercise, a -a one-of-a-kind personal training facility in the UK owned and run by world-class personal trainer Ted Harrison. For over 30 years, Ted has been very successful in helping people achieve great results. And if you've seen the blog post for his episodes on this podcast, you will see that he walks the walk. And at 56, he's a beast and in excellent shape. Operating from a high intensity training base, Ted uses an eclectic mix of training styles to optimize results for his clients. Ted put me through one of the best workouts of my life and is someone I go to for advice often. To book a free consultation either at his facility in Essex in the UK or to find out more about his virtual coaching, which includes personalized training, nutritional and motivational advice, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Ted, where you can fill in a contact form or phone Ted directly. That's corporatewarrior.co forward slash Ted. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. I'm coming at you on a pretty dreary Friday morning here in Galway in Ireland after wasting a lot of my morning playing a silly game called Polytopia, which is a strategy game that's very similar to Sid Meier's Civilization, for those of you that know that game. Um, So just to show you that, you know, I'm not superhuman, I don't always have this perfect morning of productivity uh, that you might expect, and I often screw around and waste time. So it's not perfect every morning, but hey, I'm only human and um, that is life. So this podcast teaches you how to optimize productivity and health, career, business, and lifestyle by interviewing the most effective people around today, including people like Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Ben Greenfield, Dr. Doug McGuff, Skylar Tanner, Drew Bay, uh, and then business people like David Allen, Tom Church, Stuart Ralph, Keith Norris. So I just try and find the best people at what I'm trying to learn or what I think you guys are interested in learning about in terms of productivity and health and business and try and bring their knowledge to the table. My next guest is Brian Johnston. Brian Johnston was the founder and president of the International Association of Resistance Trainers, 
otherwise known as IART, a certification institute for fitness professionals, which he sold in 2009, but remains as a director of education. He's also the director of education for prescribed exercise clinics. He has lectured internationally on the topics of sports nutrition, health and exercise science, was the editor in chief and contributing writer to both Exercise Protocol and Fit Quarterly, FITT. And he's also a contributor to Iron Man magazine and was a strength and conditioning consultant to MetRx Engineered Nutrition. He has authored over 20 books, including his latest advanced bodybuilding methods and strategies, as well as being the exercise and rehabilitation contributor to the Merck Manual. Many of you have requested Brian, and from what I've seen, he hasn't done many interviews at all. He's a bit of a ghost online. So this is somewhat of an exclusive with who many of you think, or many think, I should say, is one of the greatest personal trainers alive today. So very, very exciting to talk to Brian. We talk about his relationship with Mike Menser, his various training protocols, including triangular training and stutter reps, his belief that novelty to a pretty extreme extent, in my opinion, to shock the muscles is critical for long-term muscular development and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links, in this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't forget to wait till the end of this episode where I give you a free gift. And that's it, guys. So now I give you Brian Johnston. Well, Brian, thank you very much for taking the time today to come on to Corporate Warrior. It's uh, it's really awesome to have you on the show. Obviously, as we were talking before we started recording, a um, number of my listeners are a big fan of your work, um, and you know the uh, the the International Association of Resistance Trainers that I believe you founded. Um, so, I just with that, obviously, I I've done a fair amount of research trying to find out more about you online. It's not easy. Um, there's a few a few articles from way back in the day, but it's not easy to find. Well. I certainly didn't find it easy to find out about you. Um, so I guess for my benefit and those that don't know uh, a great deal about you, would you be able to just kind of, I guess, provide uh, an intro into terms, in terms of how you got interested in exercise and your background and that type of thing? Yeah, I, I, well, I was about maybe 13 years old when I uh, saw a copy of Muscle Builder. It was from an uncle of mine and uh, Robbie, Rob- uh, Robbie Robinson was on the cover and it was just totally fascinating for me to see someone with that kind of build. Uh, so my uncle who had the magazine also had a spring set he didn't use. He, he trained with weights. He sold me the spring set for like 20 bucks or something like that. And so that was my, uh, uh, first touch of exercise. And I slowly got, uh, into more of it. You know, I got a bull worker for Christmas. I'm not sure how many people remember that contraption, the bull worker. Uh, and then by age 15, I got into the weight training. And this is when I thought I was going to be Mr. Olympia like just about any young guy because all you needed was dedication. You know, as long as you trained hard and, you know, followed the weeder principles, you could be right. Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, flash forward, uh, I went through uh, various uh, training programs from, from all the top champions. And I started getting more into high-intensity training, uh, in other words, a brief, uh, more of a, a brief training schedule as opposed to doing, uh, you know, five, six days a week for an hour and a half, two hours at a time. And, uh, you know, games started coming on a little bit better, obviously, or they, they should because you have more recovery. And uh, it was just before 1995, uh, I, I took the ISSA certification exam. And there were so many holes and problems in terms of the certification, what it offered. Not to uh, you know speak out against them, but it, it just left so many questions. In other words, you were memorizing information that they wanted you to memorize, but you could not explain why they were why they wanted you to do certain things in in the gym or with your nutrition. And uh, it was just a little bit before. I started developing my own materials in any so I decided to take those materials and apply them to the IART. Now, you have to understand, when I write materials, I write them for my purposes. It helps me to clarify uh, ideas, and if I believe in something and I cannot explain it and put it out on paper, then I truly don't know what I'm talking about. I may have a sense that something is true, but I need to be actually, actually explain something logically. And uh, that's how I created uh, most of my materials for myself, which then expanded into the IRT. Uh, since then, my philosophy has changed 
I won't say significantly, but it has become definitely more freestyle, if you want to call it that. It's not so much locked into stone in terms of, uh, you know, going to the gym and do this, or you should be eating these particular things. Sure. How how has it changed? You know, what what are the significant differences, or, or maybe not significant, but what are the kind of differences from um, that you've made over over time? Uh, I, I'm not so much locked into the idea of having to train to muscular fatigue, uh, although you know that that's an inevitable thing. You train hard in the gym, you're going to hit fatigue, obviously, you know, some of the time. Uh, but uh, I've discovered, at, le- at least for bodybuilding purposes, you need to coax the muscle into uh, toward that state of fatigue. In other words, there has to be enough pre-fatigue coming on the, uh, to uh, create that volume aspect uh, in a muscle before you actually hit muscular fatigue. Mm. And, and uh, that doesn't mean that you're back to the Arnold Schwarzenegger programs or you know, being in the gym for an hour and a half or whatever. I can take any body part and completely finish off within 10 to 12 minutes because of the density of how I apply the training. Uh, and I, I have found that to be far more effective than just simply thinking in simplified terms. Uh, for example, going into the gym and doing uh, these 12 exercises, you know, uh, leg press, uh, pull down or chin up or whatever, and uh, doing them in a circuit fashion. And so long as you hit muscular fatigue and you're always trying to increase the weight by a little bit or the rest by a little bit, you're going to progress as much as you possibly can. And that, that simply isn't the case. Okay, so how does how does your new approach or your latest approach um, look in practice, and like what does it look like in terms of the actual protocol, the exercises, and why do you think it's more effective? Well, uh, probably the only uh, thing that I can tell you that remains consistent is the aspect of density. To give you a simple example, um, you have to keep in mind that I, uh, you know, a lot of people into hip, they, not all of them, but a lot of them will train fairly slowly. Of course, you have the one end of the spectrum with the super slow or even doing like 30 seconds up, 30 seconds down protocol for one rep. So that's really, really slow stuff. I'm more of a rhythmic t- style of tra- uh, training. And I have a lot of my people train in a very rhythmic style. And it's not sloppy. You're not dropping the weight. You're not jerking it up. But it's like a constant tension rhythm. So you get a lot more repetitions out per unit of time. Not only that, I keep the sets very short so that I can keep the rest short. So a person may be trained for 30 seconds, 25, 30 seconds, then taking a 25, 30 second rest, then repeating. Now, they may be repeating with the same exercise or the same weight. It could be a different weight. could be a different exercise. So there's various combinations that you can apply within the workout. So the only thing that remains consistent is the idea of trying to create as much density or as many repetitions without being fast, jerky, or sloppy in the shortest amount of time. So that's the only thing that's consistent. Other than that, uh, with people's programs, I change the exercises, I change the angles, I change the, the person's stance, whether they're, say, they're squatting or doing a leg press. Every workout has some different aspect involved. Even the performance of the exercises will change. Uh, I think most people uh, listening to this know what a stutter repetition is, or they know what doing one and a half reps is or doing partials you know you've done your 10 full range repetitions you can't do any more but you can still do you know 10 15 little short repetitions at the end you know something like the top of a leg press so there's so many different ways of applying patterns within the training regimen that uh, rarely do my clients repeat anything that they do it might be a year two years after the fact yeah um i, I actually don't know uh, stutter reps could you just uh, provide a definition so i understand that Oh, okay. Um, uh, traditionally, a stutter rep is this. I'll, I'll explain what a half a stutter is. So it becomes very, it's very simple. And you just have to increase the, you know, complexity of it. If you're to take a half a stutter, you'd move. Uh, let's say we're in a leg press, and you press halfway up. You then come down half that distance. So let's say you press up 16 inches. Mm-hmm. You come down eight inches, and then you press it all the way up. So in other words, you're going two steps forward, one step back, and then continuing on. Now, the actual stutter uh, stutter rep application, you just double up that amount. So you're pressing, say, one-third up, coming down a little bit, pressing two-thirds up, coming down a little bit, and then finishing up. So this is interesting. So the workouts that you... um 
practice with your clients now they they sound very very varied and there's lots of tiny nuances to it and i'm just curious um what why do you think that's because you, you clearly think that's more effective for i guess improving muscle gain um and i, I assume um pr- providing muscle gain over a long period of time and to some you know the, the peak of some someone's genetic potential so why do you think that these types of protocols are going to be more effective than a simple set to, to failure and to muscle fatigue adaptation now look at, we'll look at two things uh, we had the set principle specific adaptations to impose demands and then there's the uh, the GAS or the GAS, you know, uh, general adaptation syndrome. I'm not sure if your uh, listeners are familiar with both of these. Uh, but uh, if we look at the uh, you know set principles, specific adaptations to impose, impose demands it means exactly that. You impose demands on the body. We'll say you bench press 100 pounds 10 times, and you went to muscular fatigue. The body then adapts to that. So when you try to uh, bench press, say, 11 repetitions, same weight, or 10 repetitions with an extra 5 pounds, there's not very much of an agita- ag- agitation to the body to actually create a change. Right. Because the body has already adapted to the 10 reps. You have to do something very different. And, and this uh, goes right back to, if you look at the very broad scope of Darwinia- Darwinianism, you, you can understand that changes in... Uh, evolution occur from something significant within the environment, not something that's subtle, but something that's actually significant to create those changes. Now, we're talking about bodybuilding, so it's not as pronounced, but the, the principle still remains the same. Now, for those unfamiliar with the general adaptation syndrome, uh, Dr. Hans Salier, and I may be pronouncing his last name incorrectly, he has done research right back in the, into the 1970s and onward how the body tends to go through various processes uh, from any type of stress or stressor. So when you exercise, you stimulate and create an alarm reaction in the body. Now you have to rest and recover for that alarm reaction to turn into a stage of resistance. In other words, you become more resilient to the exercise by adapting, by becoming stronger, having larger muscles. And if you do that too often without enough recovery, you, turn, you then go into a stage of exhaustion. In other words, overtraining. Mm-hmm. Now, so let's look at the concept of adaptation once again. If you adapt, let's say you did uh, put an inch on your arms, inch, inch of muscle, and you are 30 or 40 percent stronger, whatever the number happens to be. The body is more resilient to change. And building that muscle is proof of it. It doesn't want to get any bigger. You are forcing the body to actually get larger, stronger. Mm-hmm. Now, strength, by and large, uh, by and large, you know, 50% of strength is neurological based. In other words, you practice. Practice makes perfect. So you get really good at the bench press if you did nothing but the bench press. If all of a sudden you turn to incline dumbbell press or uh, some kind of a machine press, medex, hammer strength, whatever. That is very different to the muscles, and you'll find that you are relatively weak at those movements compared to the bench press that you always, always practice. Practice something. The body adapts in various ways by using intramuscular coordination to make the exercise more proficient without having to put on muscle. And I've seen people, and I've experienced it, whereby they are able to lift progressively heavier loads, and yet the muscle slowly shrinks over time. When I'm talking about over time, I'm talking about over six months or 12 months. Oh, really? Because the body's just becoming more neurologically adept at being able to lift it, and it doesn't, ha- it doesn't want to have more muscle mass. You've got to force it to have more muscle mass. And the way you train for a muscle is different than how you train for strength. And John Grimmick made that point back in the 1940s. He used to compete in Olympic uh, weightlifting along with bodybuilding. So if he wanted to uh, compete in bodybuilding, a contest was coming up, he did not train like an Olympic weightlifter. And when he wanted to do Olympic weightlifting compete, he dropped his bodybuilding applications and went straight into Olympic weightlifting. Right. And so, that's true of any, uh, anyone in the sports. If you want to be really good at tennis, you practice tennis. If you want to be good at doing a triathlon, you've got to get into the, the triathlon events. If you want to build strength, you build strength, expect some muscle, but don't think you're going to optimize the muscular development because it's a different adaptation to that of being able to be proficient and good at lifting weights. 
Yeah. So yeah, it, so it almost sounds like from your point of view, it's it's like kind of simple with sports because it's like you want to get really good at sports. It's like we'll train the specific sport, uh, and and that's something that you know I'm familiar with, and a lot of my listeners are. Um, but bodybuilding, from your point of view, certainly when you get to your certainly when you get to your limit, I suppose um, it's not that simple. You can't just lift weights continuously. You have to vary the protocol, as you've been explaining. Um, but how does like one know? I mean, obviously, you know, we all don't have a Brian Johnson, Johnston, even um, say your name correctly. Uh, we don't have you looking after over our shoulder, telling us, I guess, what to do and what exercise to do next, and and what what cadence and uh, you know what type of uh, reps, etc. So how do how do we if we want to follow this method and experiment with it? Like, how do we put that into practice for ourselves to see? You know, how, how might we say, oh, I've done a chest press, uh, and then I want to follow that up with like a completely different chest exercise? Like, how do you choose which one to do? Have you got kind of a framework i guess would be a better question yeah yeah you know bill Prilk uh, had a very uh, good comment uh, he, he's doing a, a seminar with um dave draper this was I'm, I'm guessing maybe 10 years back uh and someone asked them what their favorite exercise was we'll say for triceps and uh, dave draper meant like a, an overhead extension with a barbell or it was some exercise Bill Pearl, on the other hand, uh, my favorite exercise is the one I'm not used to. <laughs> and so, you know, there's only so many good exercises out there. You know, there's only so many that people choose for back or chest or any muscle group because, you know, they feel best. So you are then uh, directed to how can I change how I do the exercise. And that's where we get into the patterns and, you know, different modalities to make that exercise feel more unique. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, what is going to work better than, is one application going to work better than the next? You don't know until you do it. I've done uh, workouts where I thought I was going to be so darn sore the next day and I feel nothing. And other workouts where I just, just sort of farted around because you know, I was busy and I just want to get it in, and I was actually quite sore the next day. Now, whether or not other stress factors in my life affected the soreness, I have no idea. A lot of people don't know really what contributes to that because you, something, like I said, sometimes you think you have a great workout and it just doesn't feel that sore. But certainly how the muscles respond to a workout and how they look full the next day or if they look kind of flat or no, no better than typical, a lot about the effectiveness of the workout. So you have to, uh, when you, as you experiment, you play around with things, different exercises, how you do different exercises, and even how many sets you do, how long the workout lasts, things like that, pay attention to how the muscle group responds specifically. And that will at least guide you toward future workouts. That doesn't mean that you're going to do that exact same workout the exact same way, but there are certain characteristics in place that you should pay attention to. To uh, give you a very simple example, because I know this can get really complex, because there's a lot of experimentation that can take place with a person. Uh, just consider low reps versus high reps. Mm -hmm. My back structure responds very well to heavier lower reps. No matter how I apply the exercise or what exercise I choose, I keep it heavier. My legs do not respond very well. I, uh, I've, I've squatted 400 pounds for singles and doubles before, and my legs shrunk from it. But as soon as I go around 300 pounds and I start getting up around 20 reps, Petition mark, then they blow up like crazy, at least, you know, relative to doing the really heavy stuff. So my legs don't respond to the heavy stuff. Mm. How do you measure that? Do so, you, yeah. Sorry, Brian. Go on. That's sure. Right. No, no, go ahead. No, I mean, how, how do you. No, no, go ahead. Because I know, I know people, I know some people that will be listening and being, you know, uh, kind of critical of that and will kind of go, okay, well, how are you, how are you measuring that change? Like, are you, are you, are you kind of using like I guess circumference measurements? Like, what what are you? How can you kind of guarantee that that's true? I suppose is what I'm asking. Well, well, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. I, I take photos all the time, but uh, there must be times when you look in the mirror and say, "Holy smokes, my chest looks good today." <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, like it's pretty obvious. Now, with some people, that's not going to happen. You got some little skinny fifteen year old. It's hard for him to determine what the heck's going on until something starts to build. You've got to have some muscle tissue to actually see it. You have people who are too, 
too uh, overweight. They're, they're carrying like 30, 40 pounds of excess fat, and they think they're larger and in charge when they're wearing uh, a sweatshirt, but they're too embarrassed to wear a tank top. Well, they're not going to see a heck of a lot in terms of the response. Mm. And many women have difficulty seeing development in certain areas, although they're lucky enough, usually arms, shoulders, upper back, they can see it a little more effectively. So, you know, there's that visual cue. And, you know, as long as you're looking in the same mirror and the same lighting all the time, uh, it, it seems pretty obvious when something looks good on you and that a body part has responded. The last, I have that extra flare. They seem to be wider than usual or, uh, you know, the, the chest, you know, it thickens out a bit more. You get a better peak on your biceps. You know, is, uh, as a subjective as it seems, it's actually more objective than going to the gym and saying, okay, I'm going to go for an extra rep on the bench press. Yeah. Because you're not paying attention to the response of the muscles. You're thinking too mathematically about it. You're thinking in terms of how a power lifter applies exercise or an Olympic lifter. It's all about the numbers. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you can't go too much by the measurements either because you will find that a muscle will only grow so large at a particular point, whatever point you're measuring. And you can actually uh, obtain more development in other areas. In other words, uh, to give you an example, you can measure your arm. Your arm always measures 16 inches, but it looks better developed. Now, why would it look better developed, although it measures the same? Because there's different areas that you're not measuring that could actually be developing. And, uh, you know, uh, for the past decade, and I had quite a few of these studies uh, written out in one of my books, so, you know, I can't quote anything right offhand. But for at least for the last decade and probably closer to 20 years, they've been doing uh, research with MRIs and other uh, uh, tools to determine that when a muscle contracts, it does not contract from origin to insertion. As you go from a stretch to a contraction, there's various fibers that are contracting and they're shifting attention onto other fibers. And that is especially true if you compare, say, an incline curl to a spider curl, you know, one that you're bent over, or like a concentration curl. Mm -hmm. The fibers that are actually being activated and the extent to uh, which a group of fibers being activated is different from exercise to exercise, but also based on their positioning. And I think that's why uh, when I, uh, uh, you know, started really promoting zone training, you know, working in various segments and working in those segments at a time. For example, working the leg press for 10, 15 reps and going to the top half, once you start reaching fatigue for 10 or 15 repetitions, so you're working different leverage points. That is more effective than just doing the full range reps because you are concentrating your effort in little in sections that are in zones at a time and creating a greater fatigue response with, with those particular fibers that are working in that particular area before shifting out of that position. Right, so you feel that that's that that's that's is that the same as J reps? Is that the same thing, or is that a slight difference? Yes, yeah, yeah. No, um, no, no, same thing. Well, one of my colleagues called it J reps after me, but uh, oh. I, I think zone zone training kind of sounds a little more uh, professional or a little more applicable. <laughs> and okay, that's interesting because I know that um, I've heard that the opposite of that from I guess colleagues of yours in this field um, that they feel that you know they get just as much activation for like a full range of motion. So do you, you just could be disagree with that based on what you've seen in practice and in, and in the science. Is that what you're saying? And, and also in how their physiques look, mm. you know, I don't, I don't want to sound overly, overly critical, but I know what my physique looked like when I was 15, 16, age 25, I weighed 160 pounds, maybe 165. Now it's fairly lean, a little bit leaner than what I am now. So, you know, I'll see I have a little more fat on me now, but you still see my abs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, right now I'm 200 pounds. How old are you now, if you don't want me asking, Brian? Uh, I'm 52. Oh, right. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, you look good. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, know, I know what it has taken over the years. And, you know, when I started getting into zone training, I was uh, one, I think I was 188. And uh, it, within, that, within a year of doing that zone training, I popped up to 198. And that was like a significant increase of muscle. Uh, you know, I, I, I was training for years, keep in mind. I was like 40 years old at the time. And that was a significant increase for me. And there was nothing else that changed except for that training protocol. So anyone who says, uh, oh, I can get as much activation with full range reps, okay, how much uh, did you put on after 30 years of training doing your full range reps? So, okay, you've been training for 30 years? I'll give you another year to put on 10 pounds. Let's see you do it. Uh, and I don't have great uh, uh, genetics. I, got, I have small wrists, 
small forearms. You know, not everything's big on me, but I, I'm fairly well put together because I'm thinking in terms of a bodybuilder. Okay. Um, that's interesting because, uh, you know, I, uh, so people that have listened to recent episodes and um, will know that, uh, you know, I interviewed John Little uh, as a call for uh, body by science uh, for the second time recently. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been training for probably like 10 years. I'm 30. And, um, I'm at a point now where I'm pretty happy with my physique. You know, I play basketball. I, uh, I'm happy with the muscle that I've developed and my body composition, uh, insofar as my ability to perform well on the court and just look good aesthetically and be strong and enjoy my workouts. Um, mm -hmm. that being said, you know, I'm pretty ectomorphic. So I'm, I'm a part of that camp that does want to, <laughs> that's probably been a bit more obsessed with gaining muscle um but the 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 what will most people will say you know most some of the you know, the most um revered people in this field um it, certainly in the kind of high intensity training and research-based exercise field will say you know you'll reach your genetic potential in a couple years and then beyond that it's the, the 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 there's not really much to be had and the pursuit of that can be quite pointless um now do you think that you know, anyone could probably get the genetic potential or near to um, doing some of the techniques you used to do, you know, some of the more kind of simple single set to failure type stuff and that your more advanced trainings and stuff we've been talking about, like J reps and so on, um, is really to kind of coax that last few pounds, if anything, or do you feel actually there's more to it than that? No, no, you pretty much uh, have it correct, and I, I'm not trying to suggest like uh, what I'm doing is the be the be all and end all to optimize muscular size. You know, I really don't know because it took me up until age 40 to start re-examining things because I didn't like the way I was looking. I was actually getting stronger and looking a little more flat. Uh, I still have uh, the photos when I, I took when I was 40 years old, and I'm thinking, what the hell happened? Because <laughs> I remember looking better when I was in my early 30s. So you know, you chalk it up to age. You always think, well, I'm getting older, less testosterone, so, but I am stronger than what I was in my 30s. So, you know, obviously there's that, there's that neurological aspect. And that's when I started getting more into the experimental phase and doing uh, uh, the things that uh, are a lot more random, if you want to call it like uh, uh, improv, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, going into the gym and not even knowing what I'm going to do, I might have an idea of what exercise I want to do because I haven't done them for a while, but how I do them, I have no idea until I get down there and start working out. When I say down there, I, I'm living in my house, so I have my gym down, <laughs> downstairs. Um, so uh, I have nothing against what a lot of the HIT community is suggesting. It's good, hard exercise is going to produce results. I am not arguing that. What I am arguing is that if they think that's what it takes to optimize muscular hypertrophy, then they're wrong. But, you know, not everyone wants to optimize. I, I think most men, at least, want to. I don't care what program they're using. If, they, if you said to them, I can actually give you an extra inch on your arms or make your abs look more developed or <laughs> any other trait, they wouldn't say, oh, I don't want that. That's gross. You know, I mean, if it was handed to them, they would accept it. But the idea of having to break out of your comfort zone and your shell of how you train, of what you believe and what you are promoting to the public as being the best, and then all of a sudden you're doing something completely different, it's not going to happen in most respects. You know, it's no different than people who believe in a particular religion or a particular political stance. How do you convince a communist to uh, believe in capitalism? Yeah. You know, uh, I find exercise, the industry, is very much locked in that mindset. And I've had many, I do workshops here. People come up for weekend workshops. And uh, by and large, they're all hip-based. Mm -hmm. And I still consider myself hip-based because if I can, if I train a muscle group once a week uh, for no more than 10 to 12 minutes, and every fourth week, I take an entire week off, which is probably more frequent than what most hitters do, oh, yeah. an entire week, uh, once a month or so, then that's pretty much hit-based. Like, I, I do, uh, my workouts only last about 20, 25 minutes. I train it three times a week. Okay. But it's how I get there. 
that's more important than actually reaching muscular fatigue because once again the body adapts and if you're always training muscular fatigue and you've been doing it for 20 years there's nothing new about it what about if, if you i mean what most i guess um certainly those that i've spoken with and guests and such um will do from a if they're training kind of more traditional high intensity training is they will have they will kind of like if you take for instance uh Dr. Del McGuff uses um, a big five or a two-way split and a three-way split. Are you familiar with these kinds of protocols, I assume? Yeah, yes, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So he'll, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, so he'll kind of ebb and flow depending on how he feels and his schedule. He'll might do a big five, then he might do um, a two-way split and then a three-way split and then come back to the big five if he feels more recovered. Um, so they, they, they will kind of, a lot of people kind of take that approach to, um, I guess providing the body with some novelty. And so I guess try and drive the kind of gains that you're talking about. But do you feel like well, that's yeah. not sufficient? You feel like yours would be more. Well, it, it's, uh, it's on the right track. Mm. But if you're doing, uh, let, let's say you got those three workouts and you only repeat uh, each one once a month. Well, you're still repeating it once a month. Yeah. You know, I mean, so the variation is there. There is some variation, but it's limited because after a month, it's no longer variation. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like a, uh, just a, a cycle that you're going through of the same things. Mm, okay. So, the, you know, the, the, uh, so if, if Dr. McGuff believes that is of value, that type of variation has value, then you can't discredit the, uh, the um, uh, purpose of variation because he's actually instilling it himself. Mm. I'm just taking to the extreme. Mm. Um, could you just, I guess, so I can understand this better. What, you know, you mentioned your workouts there three times a week, which workout lasts around 25 minutes. What does, uh, <laughs> again, I guess this is difficult for you to answer because um well actually if you could say like what, what was your last workout like what did that look like in terms of exercises and protocol okay so uh t today i did arms you know nice easy workout you know compared to legs uh and doing <laughs> back and chest uh i don't always do that sometimes i'll do back with biceps and chest with triceps or what have you but uh now, this is what makes it difficult to explain. Uh, I, I did two exercises. I did standing dumbbell curls and incline curls. Mm -hmm. Each consisted of four sets. Each set was probably no more than 30 seconds, 30, 35 seconds, uh, maybe 40 tops. That might be, might be pushing it. I didn't really uh, time my rest. I just you know got my breathing going, maybe t taking in five to ten deep breaths and continuing on. So I'm not... Uh, too concerned about you know watching the clock for a certain amount of rest time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, with the standing dumbbell curl, I'll start off with something fairly light, maybe like 17 and a half pound weights, uh, and I'll knock off 40 to 50 reps. And people are saying, "Holy smokes, 40, 50 reps!" Well, they're, they're not that heavy, and I'm working in zones and I'm improvising. So, for example, I might be working into that middle third, and I'm just, you know, popping off the reps one and two and three and four. Then I'm working the top half. Then I'll shift into the bottom third, then maybe the bottom half. Then I'll work into the middle three-quarter. So I'm all over the place creating random patterns. Now, I'll step up to the next set of dumbbells, which might be like 27 and a half. I think uh, the heaviest I went was like around 37 and a half, 40 pounds, something like that today. Uh, when I go really heavy, by the way, I do a lot of full range reps, so I'm not against full range reps. Because when you do something really heavy, it's very difficult to work in a rhythm and work in these little partials. <laughs> I mean, so you're, you're more or less leveraging, I'm just powering up the, the heavier stuff. But when I work with the lighter stuff, although I create a lot of different patterns, I do far more uh, freestyling with it. To give you a good example of a, a freestyle, um, most people are familiar with a, a leg press you know, or even a squat. You know, it's a lot harder at the bottom than what it is at the top because of the leverage changes. So let's say you start with uh, full range reps in the leg press just to get a little bit of a warm up. You do three or four reps. Then you want to make it a little more difficult. You start working in that bottom half. And the, the effort starts increasing, level seven, level eight to level nine. You get out of the bottom half, start working the top half to provide some relief, but yet you're still working the reps and creating that density within your workout. You're getting a little bit of recovery because the top half's not that hard. Then you shift it into the middle third. 
you pick that up to about a level 10. You get out of there and you uh, work, start working in the top third of the leg press because it gives you some relief from that really uh, torturous middle third. But you're also getting a little bit of recovery because it's, a little, you know, it's easier up there. Then you can start throwing in some more full range repetitions because you have the ability to lift more weight full range than what you do when working in a zone, and especially if it's a difficult zone. So you get back into the full range reps. But eventually you can't do any more full range reps, so, so you may want to go back to the top third and knock off eight or ten partials, and then you're set up done. So you, you understand the, uh, the improv that I do, I create random patterns, but I also will apply those patterns to the feedback at the time. So I can take a weight that feels too heavy and make it feel not that hard just by simply going into uh, you know, a leverage point where you have better, yeah. you know, more strength. And then the same thing with a weight that feels a little bit too light, you can make that feel super hard just by getting into that very difficult zone of pumping out enough reps with it. So when, when I'm training, I'm paying attention to the feedback of my body. Is this getting to be too, diff, too no, difficult? No, no, keep, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so is it becoming oh, too difficult oh, to... Uh, oh, yeah, I know, I know where you're coming from. Uh, is it becoming too difficult for me to continue on, or do I need to make it more difficult? And usually based on uh, a repetition goal I may have. I don't always have a repetition goal. I, uh, sometimes I don't know that I'm going to do 30 repetitions or even 15, but... Um, if I know I want to get a, in higher repetitions because I'm working my legs, I know that I need at least 15 or more repetitions. So I will adjust my freestyling based on wanting at least 15 repetitions. Mm. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not. Yeah, it does. I'm just trying to understand like how, because a lot of this is obviously in the in the moment intuitive and as you say freestyling. How do you track from workout to workout in terms of your performance, or do you not do that? Like how? No, I don't, uh, I don't track my performance because I'm not competing. Mm. I'm not going to a competition knowing that I have to lift a certain amount of weight or do a certain number of repetitions. You know, you have something like CrossFit. Uh, a lot of it is based on repetitions. How many uh, uh, pull cleans can you do with a certain weight or chin-ups or whatever? So there's always that repetition count. Yeah. Uh, same thing with powerlifting and Olympic lifting, you know, things like that. When you do it for health purposes and for the stimulus of the body, You've got to be completely uh, out of your comfort zone. You can't be doing things that you normally do, uh, at, at least when you're trying to optimize. Mm -hmm. You know, health, health, uh, health that's different. Uh, you know, I, I, I said health uh, purposes. There's nothing wrong with counting reps and going for the weight and uh, just being focused, you know, focused on your health at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a very simplified version of effective weight training. And that's how I look at most of the industry is a lot more simplified because everyone's looking for the formula or the method to use. Mm -hmm. And I've, uh, I've released a number of books dealing with uh, variation and creating variation. And I might, I, you know, I, I put a lot of these uh, in a little booklets into one larger book, which is about 500 pages. And I did, once again, I did that for myself. I just wanted to create a catalog of you know, the ideas I've been speaking about. And in this 500-page book, I probably have uh, close to 100, 100 different methods. Mm -hmm. But you have people who will buy the book, use the first one that's in there, and they'll use it till they're almost blue in the face, say, wow, this really works, and eventually, you know, it's not working. What's wrong? Well, geez, move on. <laughs> you, you, you've milked it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, within about two or three workouts, you've milked it. I do have some clients who will do the same program, but uh, rarely do they do it three times, uh, more than three times in a row. And you could tell uh, even their motivation to try, want to keep pushing themselves, they're getting bored with it. And so you, you may be asking, well, how do people go into a gym to hire a personal trainer and they do the same 10 exercises over and over and over again? It's because they don't know any different. If you were born as a slave in a country, that's all you know. As soon as you're given your freedom, it's like you cannot believe what life was like before compared to what it is now. And I find personal training is the same thing. I have people coming to me because of the incredible variation that they do, and I have some clients, it's been two years, they haven't even done the same program twice. Yeah. I've never recycled them back to the very beginning yet because we're coming up with new ideas and new challenges. And they freaking love it because they have no idea what's going to take place when they come to the gym. And they're very anxious, excited to do it. And they get a very good response. Now, they're not going to optimize their muscular potential. They come to me once a week because i got to try and fit in the entire body 
within a one-hour session or a 15-minute session. You know, they train longer than I do, obviously, because they're trying to cover all the muscle groups. And, you know, I get them on a neck machine and a low back machine. We do work their cuff work, so we have to take care of the little things. Uh, but they produce a far better response, and they're far more motivated to exercise than having to do that cookie-cutter program over and over and over again. Interesting. So I know I know some people listening might be thinking, Okay, well, like saying, you know, I certainly understand what you're saying. And I think listeners do in terms of like, you know, you're not, it's not mathematical. We're not trying to increase the numbers here. We're trying to reach muscular fatigue. That's the most important thing, I suppose, or, you know, fatigue. Well, no, you're okay. trying to, uh, muscular fatigue is uh, an end result. What you're trying to do, you know, you know, you know the saying, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Right, yeah. You know, you heard that before. So, you know, when you do a road trip, the road trip is just as much fun or it could be terrible <laughs> depending on, you know, which, uh, which, uh, you know, road you veer off onto or if you stay on the main highway, uh, and then the destination. And the way I look at it, you have uh, a main highway. Here's your, uh, high intensity training program, train the failure, doing certain exercises, throw so many reps, and your street down the highway, there's your destination, muscular fatigue. Whereas I like to veer off into the side roads because you never know what, uh, little farmer's market or antique shop you're going to come across that makes it far, not only far more, more enjoyable, but, uh, more value to the trip. But you're, you're these side roads, like what are the, the outcomes? How do they differ from muscular fatigue? Because I, I thought that was what, you know, every, everything you're doing is kind of with that, that focus in mind. Well, well, once again, it's how you get there. You know, uh, go back to what I've seen before about how I, I stack a lot of small sets. Yeah. Uh, I'll do one exercise, but uh, I might do four, exercises, uh, four sets of it. But, uh, and, and that may seem like high volume to one person, but when each set is only about 30 seconds, four sets, that's a total of two-minute tension time, right? Yeah. And during that time, I might be able to knock off uh, 60, 70 repetitions. So the, uh, it's the excursions, the number of repetitions, and the blood volume that's being worked into the muscle and the number of contractions that the fibers have to constantly work at that has more of a bodybuilding effect. Once again, we're talking about bodybuilding here, not just weight training, getting strong, looking good, feeling good. We're talking about optimizing hypertrophy. Absolutely. And this stuff has been known, it has been known for decades. You know, it's just because of the wide rampant use of anabolic steroids that we are getting misguided in terms of uh, proper application. But even today's bodybuilders still have it right. They may be on a boatload of drugs and they have good genetics for building muscle or at least responding to the drugs, but they still work in that rhythmic manner. They cluster a lot of sets together. One person, uh, you know, if you're with a trained partner, by the time he's done his set, you're on your next set. Well, these sets are only about 30 seconds long. They're not like two minutes of uh, super slow stuff. Yeah. So the response in muscle is different. That's why, you know, you, you hear um, uh, maybe some people from the HIIT community, I'm sure they sort of put down bodybuilders saying they're not as strong as they look. Sometimes. Now, now you, you know, there, there's a reason for that, right? A greater cross-sectional of the area of muscle uh, can't produce progressively more force. So, you know, like uh, a guy with a 20-inch arm, I bet you he doesn't lift, uh, maybe he lifts dumbbells that are maybe 15, 20 pounds heavier than what I use. Now, that's still 15, 20 pounds heavier, but he's got 20-inch arms. I don't have 20-inch arms. Mm-hmm. So he's stronger, but he's not stronger relative to his size. Yeah. And the reason being is that he's not focused on the strength. He's bodybuilding. So bodybuilding gives you a different effect. It's a different adaptation. Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of the hit people is getting confused. And again, I'm not knocking hit. I've done it for years, and I have some clients. That's how they train. They, they may not do like a circuit style, but it's, you know, very few sets per body part, maybe uh, two, two or three, one set each. And if they don't hit muscular fatigue, I'll make sure that they get to like a solid level nine out of 10. You know, in other words, they get a pretty good effort and I try to push them a little bit harder to get to that level 10. So they do train like that, but their focus is not on bodybuilding. They want to, you know, they want to look better. They want to build some muscle. They want to feel more functional and be stronger, and they do it for health purposes. So, again, I have them in a different direction. Then I have people who come to me. I want to maximize my bodybuilding potential. And if we go back to what I was saying before about, you know, people come to me for workshops, these are people who's, you know, done all kinds of hit routines about all the Dr. Darden books and, you know, Arthur Jones programs have gone through it all. Mm-hmm. And then when I teach them how to improvise and I coach them toward it, 
the, the look on their face is like they've never experienced anything like that before. No. Mainly because their muscles are not used to it. Yeah. I've never had anyone who's worked all out after two days not say some of my muscle groups actually have a different shape from two days. Really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, because so. of the way the muscle pops out. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're, the soreness is extreme, which makes sense because they're not used to what I gave them. So I wouldn't expect anything other than really devastating soreness. So uh, that, that's kind of typical. But there's something that surprised me, uh, at least initially, that was, you know, like a, maybe eight, nine years back when I started getting some hip people coming to me for workshops. And the next day, you could actually see it in them. Their shoulders were more pronounced. Their pecs looked thicker. And it was from one workout. Now, I'm not saying that's going to stick. You know, I mean, some of it could be inflammation. There's different things affecting a muscle. But the point is that they never had that effect from what they, what they were doing. Okay. So I'm just thinking of people listening who might want to experiment with trying your type of approach to training. Um, you obviously described a workout there. And I know it's really hard to talk to kind of dictate it as much. I'm sure it's so much easier when you're actually like, well, not easy, but it's, it's easy to understand when you're actually doing it or seeing you do it, for instance, or watching yeah, yeah, someone yeah. do it. Um, it's the same with high intensity training, trying to describe it to someone is so hard. You just, they just need to do it. Um, now, how do you, how does one know like when too much volume when volume is too much from say trying one of these workouts is it well you know so long as the workout ends with fatigue that then you know you, that you know that's where your your workout will end or you know how, how do we how do we moderate the volume i suppose to make sure that that's not overdone okay now th this is difficult to give to beginners many of the advice i'm about to give is difficult to give to beginners it's somewhat difficult to give to women unless they've been retraining for a little bit and they have some muscle. So you have, you have to have people who are experienced. And that only makes sense because someone who's not that experienced, they can do just about any program and produce results. So, you know, I don't really care about someone who's only been training for one or two years. Let them, you know, do their thing, buy the magazines, try different stuff, you know, let it, experiment on your own, have fun with it. Someone who's been at it for a while, who's actually familiar with a muscle pump, uh, or how a muscle feels in terms of the quality of the contraction, those are the people who can take away the advice I'm about to give. Okay. Now, if you recall, uh, back in the 60s, Vince uh, Granda suggested that a muscle is done being trained once the pump no longer increases and it, as it starts to subside, you definitely have to stop training. In other words, let's say you're doing uh, three or four different exercises, you're doing, uh, you know, two or three sets, four sets, or whatever, you got to keep in mind, you, you can't train a muscular fatigue doing this until you're on your last set of a particular exercise. You, gotta, you always got to pace yourself because you want to get those sets in there in a cluster format, short set, short rest. So let's say you're doing various exercises and you get a nice pump in the biceps and you keep doing exercises, you notice the pump's not getting any bigger. In fact, you're starting to deflate a little bit. That is your cutoff point according to Vince Granda. Hmm. Now, I've taken that a, a little bit further. At least this works better for me and for some of the people I've uh, suggested it to. You go into the gym, and if you were to flex a muscle group, and I don't care if it's your quads, your back, or your pecs, or whatever, when you flex a muscle group, it has a certain feel. You haven't started training yet. Then you do a bit of a warm-up. What you're going to notice after a warm-up is that the muscle contracts harder. You know, a lot of hip people are not into warm-ups. Well, muscles contract hard. You'll produce better results from doing a warm-up. So if you're going to do a circuit of exercises, do a circuit with 50% of the weight. Mm -hmm. Just you know, knock off 10, 12, 15 reps, go to the next one. Nice and light, only 50%. And you will find the muscles will contract harder and produce a better effect. Now, as you do one set to the next, you're going to notice that the muscle contracts even harder, feel really solid, almost cramps up. But eventually, you're going to notice from adding more and more sets or an extra exercise that as you flex the muscle group it feels a little bit blobby <laughs> it's like someone poured cement or it doesn't have a solid hard contraction it feels kind of like almost like um, um, got a little bit dead if you know what I mean mm -hmm. that is your cutoff point Right, so that's very, it's very kind of like, um, I guess, intuitive, and you have to kind of just gauge that of each one of your muscle groups, I suppose. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, going go to the gym, if it's going to be a bicep day, flex your bicep. How does it feel? Okay. Do a little bit of a warm up. How does it feel? Oh, it's contracting harder. Okay, start doing your exercises. I don't know how many, so many exercises, but every now and then, it's really intense. You know, you probably still go to go oh. further. Brian, you're starting, you know to, I mean? you're starting to break up a little bit. Do you mind just repeating that last bit about the bicep training? Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, we're, you know, biceps are very basic muscle group, so they're the easiest to understand. You go into the, the gym and you flex your arm and it has a certain feel. And you're going to be able to flex and feel a nice hard contraction. You do a bit of a warm up and it's going to should it feel even more intense in terms of the contraction. If you, as, as you go progress through your workout, you know, whether you do one or two exercises, a couple of sets here and there, keep flexing that bicep between sets. And it feels very hard and solid and almost cramps up to go. Mm-hmm. Losing that neurological connection feels a very uh, sluggish, muscle has a sluggish feel. You've already gone far enough and you need to stop. Right, okay. okay. I got most now, of that. My, uh, Sorry, go on. <laughs> the other point I want to make is that it doesn't mean you have to keep training to that extent. For example, uh, if you know that it takes. 10 to 12 minutes and we'll say eight, nine short sets to reach that point. You don't have to do that every time. You could do half that amount and all, every second or third workout, you may want to push yourself to that extreme. You know, I, I don't recommend pushing, pushing the extremes all the time, but the, that, that is where the extreme is in terms of cutting off the number of sets you do. And most people into hip, they never reach that extreme because they never do enough sets to hit it. You know, you, you can do uh, uh, what would be a typical uh, hit back workout, a set of pull downs, a set of rows, and maybe a set for the low back. Yeah. Well, guaranteed, when you flex your back after doing that, it doesn't feel like it's finished. It doesn't feel, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word numb, but it doesn't feel as if though it's lacking control. You still feel solid and hard. And you, got, and you have to pace yourself because a lot of hit programs are full body. So you've got to save energy for the other body parts. Mm-hmm. So you're cutting yourself short in terms of trying to optimize the muscle mass based on trying to pace yourself. Uh, that's interesting. Um, now, that's, that's, good. that's a good kind of like, I guess, uh, policy to follow um, for those that want to like give this type of training a go. Um, do you have, you mentioned your books, which I will link to uh, in the post. Um, how, what, what, what's your most recent book that you, I think you, 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 you posted a picture that uh, you sent to me. I can't remember the title now. What was the most recent one? You yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I only need 12 copies because I, I make hard co- cover copies and I uh-huh. want one for myself for my own records. And, uh, you know, I, I, I could always, if people are interested in the PDF version, I could, uh, you know, take care of that with them. But uh, okay. I released a book, Advanced Bodybuilding Strategies and uh, Methods. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, I re- released that uh, in March of 2017 this year, but it's based on two or three years of writing, dealing with uh, the concept of high-density training. So it more or less compiles the, the ideas and coordinates the ideas so that these three books I did previously are under just one cover. Um, but, you know, I've done uh, uh, DVD videos on triangular training. Uh, now, triangular training is simply creating a multi-angle effect within the same set. Uh, you know, it, it would be like, uh, I'll give you an example of the biceps. I'll start off with an incline curl. And as I get close to fatigue, I sit upright because you're stronger doing them upright. As I get close to fatigue, I'll bend forward. I have a bench in front of me for preacher curls, and I'll continue on preacher curls. So that I consider that one set, and I'll hit failure on preacher curls. Right. So the, uh, the incline to the upright hovers around that level 8, 8.5 out of 10. You keep pacing yourself to get to the preacher curl. So that's an example of triangular training, you know, to try just, you know, three sets, three different exercises. Uh, with squats, you can go from a, a narrow squat to a medium to a sumo or wide uh, stance squat because each position makes you stronger. You have better leverage, but you also uh, increase the fatigue from one position to the next. And guaranteed, doing something like that, you'll feel something very different in the legs than what you would from just doing one particular position. And the reason being is that there's different fibers working in different positions at different angles. 
So you get a lot more of a full effect in the muscle as opposed to just sticking with one particular position. I guess I, I, I hear what you're saying. I guess um, the thing that does come to mind now is like, you know, of course there's some novelty in that you're trying something different. You know, whenever someone goes from doing, you know, a, a conventional bodybuilding routine to try and hit for the first time, they'll say the same thing. So if they suddenly do a leg press one set to failure, you know, super sim- simple versus, you know, I guess some of these things we're talking about. Um like you know, they 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 get that incredible amount of uh, soreness the next day. Um, you know, they get that pump, they get that um, feel after the workout. Well, certainly in my experience. So I, I'm not. I just I I just would challenge you, I suppose, on on that that side of things. So I think that's just that just novelty just comes from a new exercise, no? Well, novelty. I call it a necessity. Because once again, the body adapts. You're trying to break free from what it has adapted to. And if you take most bodybuilders, they still do the same programs all over and over again. They're no different. Hmm. So, you know, they're doing the same thing over and over again. Even if they have more exercise and more sets involved, certainly they will become very sore from doing a basic hit program. But let's look at their bodies uh, six months after doing that. Yeah. They're going to have to change again. So I'm not saying that, that people have to change from hip to something else, but they need to uh, put in a large variety within their hip program. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that, that's the thing. Again, I, I consider myself hip-based based on what I'm doing. If you look at the older uh, programs of Arthur Jones, you remember he was like three times a week. Yeah. And uh, it was like 20 sets, you know, although some of those sets include forearms and neck. So, you know, it wasn't quite as terrible as it sounds. Um, <laughs> And when uh, and he was even in, uh, into body specialization. When uh, beca- why would you have specialization if all you could, if you could get all your muscle from doing some basic hit circuits? Why would you specialize? He saw a need for it. And when he uh, wanted someone to specialize, he would do upward of like eight to ten sets for that one body part. Oh, jeez. But he, he would have him do it all the time because, you know, you, you would overtrain that particular body part. Even if you didn't train, uh, overtrain systemically, you'd do it locally. So it, has, it had to be thrown in every now and then. But he saw value and need for it. Dr. Darden's another one. Why does he have so many books and various techniques if all you need to do is train to failure? <laughs> well, but someone, no, no, someone... no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, go on. You know, no one ever puts down Dr. Darden about not knowing or understanding hit. And yet he has a wide variety of variation. And he's coming up with a new book dealing with these uh, emphasized negatives. So he understands <laughs> you know, that you always have to change things. And he actually wrote a forward to one of my books. Uh, the first book I did on high-density high training, he did a forward for it. Uh, so, you know, uh, and he, you know, so he, he read it in advance, and he says, wow, this is really good stuff. It actually makes you think. Um, so, uh, because, uh, you know, I had him do it because not only is he hit-based, but he also understood the, uh, the necessity of variation based on his 10 or 15 books or whatever number he's done. So I just want to jump back a second um, because there's some there's a um, question from from listener um, that applies to what we were talking about recently um, with regard to um, Hans um, Sellier who you mentioned I think that's how you say that his name. Um, so what he asks is um, based on recent research by Stuart Phillips and colleagues, um, which showed that adaptation to a new stressor comes in the form of repair. And then muscle growth occurs after the body becomes used to further exposure. Um, and, and then he says, do you, do you still insist on frequent changes in workouts or to force growth, which you've already uh, uh, shared some stuff on that. Um, your stance on frequent changes in routine puts put you at odds with obviously a good few in the field. So this is obviously some of the recent literature that's coming out uh, from the likes of, you know, Dr. James Steele and, um, well, I know he peer reviewed one of these papers uh, and obviously you've got Stuart Phillips there. So what are your thoughts on some of these, some of this literature that's coming out? Uh, and do you, yeah, sorry, go on. Well, uh, I want to make sure I understand one of the first points you brought up uh, about uh, uh, the body repairs itself and then muscle grows from repeated stress. That's what the, that's what the, the, um, the listener, uh, chap by the name of Stuart is saying. Yes. So from, from the, okay. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that people who's been doing these repeated stress workouts, you know, well, we're, you know, doing, it doesn't have to be hip. I'm not, you know, I'm not putting down here. It could be sure. any workout. Uh, but how is it that months will go by and they expect their body to suddenly sprout muscle. 
That has never happened, as far as I'm concerned, in the history of bodybuilding. I've never experienced it. Uh, the people I've talked to and uh, coached uh, have never experienced it. My clients have never experienced it. If a program is effective, mm-hmm. now you have to keep in mind the, the, the conditions have to be correct. You know, the, the body goes through protein turnover, and there's different stress factors uh, in a person's life that uh, you could have one hell of a good workout, and it will mean nothing. It won't do anything for your body. But if the conditions are appropriate, the response will be immediate within days that you're going to develop muscle from that workout. Now, the first stage, of course, is recovery. You need uh, whatever glycogen you use in the muscle you have to replace. So I'm not into these really low-carbohydrate diets, but I'm not into uh, eating a bunch of junk food and a lot of starches and breads either. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you have to have some, some carbohydrate to replenish the glycogen stores. That's the first stage. The second stage, of course, would be repairing whatever damage is caused. I don't think it's that bad. It's not like that someone taking a knife and slashing your arm, you have to heal the scar. You know, it's, it's, very, it's microscopic. So how much protein and uh, how much repair time is needed, I really don't know. I never looked into it. But I do know that an effective program within a couple of days actually produces a result. Because if you were to take that same program and do it every w- workout, every week, for months on end, the body doesn't say, you know what, enough is enough. Let's just build some muscle. <laughs> yeah. We had enough of lifting these weights. We've got to build some muscle. It doesn't work like that. And as soon as the body builds muscle, and it is an immediate response, it doesn't want to build any more. It's re- more resilient to what you just did in order to build the muscle. Adaptation, specific adaptation to proposed demands. See, people think that, that the said principle has nothing more to do than selecting the right type of exercise environment to get what you want. You want to be really good at running? Well, you better practice running. If you want to be good at tennis, practice tennis. Yes, that's part of it. But as you adapt, remember, specific adaptations, you adapt by building more muscle to the imposed demands. Well, why would the body want to build any more muscle to those same demands? that you just put on it for several months or uh, even going on a couple of years. Can I, Actually, most people look the same. Do you mind if I just, yeah, no, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I just wanted to interject, but if, and sorry if, uh, you know, you've somewhat covered this already probably, but if, um, if you are performing, okay, a chest press for the 20th time, but you're, you're overloading or you're increasing the resistance and, or, and, or you're performing a longer time under load, then surely that is a new demand onto that muscle. You know, so it's not, it's not uh, okay. Well, what kind of chest press are we talking about? Okay, just, well, you, you I, I'm it. just assuming, I'm just assuming we're talking about like if you were just look at like a MedEx chest press machine, okay, okay. So, but, yeah, it, but it doesn't really matter hear, about yeah, the specifics, yeah. it's just the same it, exactly. It, it doesn't yeah. matter. I just want you to provide an example. So, the okay. MedEx chest press, let's say you uh, uh, did 100 pounds and you did 10 repetitions and you hit failure, yeah. Okay, so uh, give me an example of what you would do in the next workout. What, what's your goal to uh, so guess, impose? Yeah, I guess um, what a lot of um, hit trainees would do um, is they would they would they would look at okay, assuming let's say they increased their time under load by you know they 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 reach a time under load that they 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 felt that there was that what they were aiming aiming for so they either reached that or they okay. exceeded it they would then either increase the resistance or try and increase that time under load next time around um, okay yeah, well, yeah. Let, let, let's, let's let's look at a real life example let, well, uh, how much uh, time under load uh, did you want to put out there you you make up a number it doesn't matter well, how much would you like to? Uh, it, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, well, one of your last chest workouts, well, what was the tension time of uh, hitting failure in the medic chest press? What was the tension time? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I haven't problem that for No, 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 I, I'm trying to, no. I'm trying to work through <laughs> an actual example so you can understand better. I'll, I'll, I'll make something up for you. Let's say you hit 50 seconds. Yeah. Okay, 50 seconds with 100 pounds on the medic chest press. And let's say you went five seconds up, five seconds down. Right. Okay. For example, you know, five reps. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. What What is your? You already hit failure, and you're not like a newbie. You're not someone who's really new. Is going to go escalate in strength or in leaps and bounds. So, what's your best case scenario next workout? What are you What are you going to do in tension time if you keep the weight the same? Yeah. Uh, I guess you might you might do ten seconds more or something like that. Okay. So we're up to sixty seconds. Mm-hmm. Now you know as well as I do, the harder things get, the more people squirm around, and the sure. harder they grip things, as they squeeze their abs a bit more. So there's different things that come into play in terms of how much you can lift. 
Yeah. Most people did not. Most people did not remain semi relaxed while making the muscle group that they're training work the hardest. The whole body's working. So by and large. The muscle's not working any harder than what it did the past workout because you're just learning how to call upon other internal muscular aspects to force out the extra 10 seconds. And the same happens when you uh, say still go for 50 seconds but add five pounds to the machine. Now, so you, uh, even if you were to argue that that is bigger demands and I argue that it's not for the reasons explained that the, the body learns how to cope with more weight by squirming, squeezing things tightening up in parts not even related to the body part of your training and that happens, it's automatic um, compare that to suddenly going to an incline dumbbell press that you haven't done for five months yeah. and just grabbing like moderate weights either going full range reps or starting to do those stutter reps I explained before the, the chest muscles will pop, literally pop from that one workout compared to busting your ass on the same thing over and over again. Yeah. No, that's you know, I, I've, done, I, I've had research uh, published on this too. Uh, I, I used uh, EMG and people that might say, oh, EMG is not accurate or whatever. Well, it measures something. It doesn't matter what the hell it measures. It measures something. It measures activity. And when you do a leg extension, as an example, and this is what I test because I try to keep things very isolated. I only worked one leg, so I love the other leg just hung there. Yeah. And when uh, I produce isometric force, I wasn't uh, like lifting weights up and down. I had a uh, force gauge and everything uh, set up. Isometric force, I could produce a certain amount of force. And I, I had, it was myself and three other subjects who did this. Yeah. Uh, let's say I produced 100 pounds of force at a particular angle. And I kept my arms hanging to the sides, and I tried to keep my chest muscles, my face muscles, everything completely relaxed, and I produced 100 pounds of force. Mm -hmm. Now, the next set, you know, we'll say I took about a three, four minute break, because, you know, you get your strength back from doing a 10 second isometric after that amount of time. Uh, I would then not grab the handles, but I would squeeze my abs, like flex them, and my chest, almost like a, like a most muscular while I did the leg extension, and I could produce 120 pounds of force. Mm -hmm. Then I grabbed the handles and pulled on them, squeezed the shit out of them, and by and large, I produced 160, 170 pounds of force. You can't tell me the legs producing the same amount of force. Mm -hmm. What is happening is a transference of energy throughout the body. It's almost like uh, compacting a spring and letting it go. You know I mean, there's a, like an internal pressure because you know uh, the, the whole body is connected by uh, fascia. And by skin, so everything's connected in terms of if one thing can work a little bit harder, it actually has an effect on a different limb or a different area. So it was very easy to prove by how much you're contracting everything that you can actually progressively lift more weight. And that's what happens with it when you know, people are training not only to failure, but they're trying to push those extra pounds or you know, trying to get out of extra tension time or whatever, they're just squeezing everything even harder and harder from one workout to the next without even realizing it. Mm. So they're not making the body part work any harder. But if you keep changing up your technique and your exercises without thinking too much about how much weight you're using, about the tension time and the reps and being so focused on that, as opposed to thinking about the training experience, the results are very different. Yeah, I can I completely agree, and I um, I do I do think it's a time under load and resistance and stuff like that is obviously useful data, um, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Um, so you know, and it it, it can't be it, it's not always that meaningful from work. Well, so it, it, it yeah, it quite quite definitely isn't that meaningful from workout to workout either. So I just want to like make my position quite clear on that as well. I don't want to. Yeah, you know, and I collect that information. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I have some clients who are very much into doing, okay, I'm doing sets of 12, sets of 12. You can't get them into the freestyle stuff. They're 86 years old. You know what I mean? Like, they're just not of that, <laughs> I won't say mentality. It's as if they're not intelligent, but it's very difficult to get some say, of that age to be doing all kinds of freestyle bodybuilding. And with most of my clients, I even focus on tension time. I, I, so long as they're moving relatively slow, because remember, uh, the workout changes all the time, so I don't have to be consistent with the cadence. I don't have to say you have to be exactly four seconds up, four seconds down. I can get them to do different uh, rhythms within their training. 
Yeah. But I said, I want 60 seconds out. So if they can't give me 60 seconds, we'll say it's full range. If they can't give me that, then I get them to do the top partials, you know, such as the top of the leg press. So I want 60 seconds. Keep going. Keep giving me those reps to hit 60 seconds. And then that's their set. So I do use it as a tool, yeah. but I'm not locked into it. Yeah. Yeah, same thing with the number of reps or the weight. No, I'm not locked into any of that. It's nothing more than a tool. And then I use my creativity to manipulate those tools to provide the best training experience that I can. No, that's good stuff. Um, I guess just, just shifting gears, because I've, I've a few other things I want to cover as well with you, Brian. Um, I recently had Andrew Shaw on the podcast. It was a great, great guy and a really fun conversation. Um, and he, he was talking about, you know, your, obviously you you founded, um, iArt and, uh, and your kind of approach, which is you know, going with what you were just saying about it being a more open-minded system approach to, um, to training. And, um, you, but the thing started off with where you did have some sort of business partnership with Mike Mentor. I think that's correct. Um, yeah, is yeah. that, are you comfortable talking about that a little bit? Um, if not, don't worry, but, um, is that something that, well, oh yeah, you, you know, could... uh, p- uh, p- yeah, people think there's more animosity and it was worse than what it actually was. Yeah. And, and it's, it wasn't really that big of a deal. I, I had higher expectations <laughs> to or too high of expectations than, uh, what Mike could have given me based on his, um, mental status. And I'm not saying the guy was nuts or he's this or that. I'm just saying, like, you know, we're in different stages of our life at different times and we're e- able to uh, commit to different things uh, at different times of our lives. So I, w- I wanted to come from that perspective. You know, if you want me to go on about uh, the relationship, yeah, uh, yeah um, way, way back when, I think the first book I wrote was uh, strength training objective principles of an exact discipline and um when i wrote this i sent it out to various people in the hit community because it was very much hit based uh not like um mike mentor's uh consolidation heavy duty stuff but more like his initial uh you know split type programs and uh, so you know i wanted to get different quotes from different people and of course arthur jones good luck in trying to sell this book because there's no exact uh, principles and it's not an exact discipline. So, you know, that, you know, <laughs> typical Arthur Jones. Uh, whereas Mike Mentor thought it was very good because I put in a, a lot of um, not only theoretical but philosophical aspects, and he was into Ayn Rand at the time, so he, he, he appreciated it. Sure. And he wrote the foreword. So from there, well, it was shortly after that that I started up the IRT because of my I guess discussed with the certification that I did have at the time, and I felt like I was more confused than anything. Uh, I asked him, you know, once I had the uh, IRT going for a couple of years, if he would like to jump on board as a partner, because I liked what he had to say. Uh, I wasn't really into his consolidation stuff too much at the time, uh, but I appreciated and respected him as an individual. And definitely because of his notoriety, if I wanted to become well known with the IRT, not myself per se, but the organization, I'd rather be under his uh, influence yeah. than, say, Arnold Schwarzenegger's. You know what I mean? <laughs> because our uh, philosophy was a lot closer than uh, what it was with you know other people in the industry. So he agreed to become partners with the IRT. Uh, so during uh, our relationship, I created. I probably produced about maybe 10, 15 books on various subjects. You know, it was all weight training, nutrition based, but, uh, it was, uh, each book would, you know, tackle a different subject on it. And he was still sort of stuck in the, uh, consolidation mode. He didn't really contribute a heck of a lot except to mention us in articles in Iron Man. And I, it kind of bothered me, but, you know, I'm a workaholic and I like producing things. So, you know, I'm just a different person. So uh, he was a workaholic in a different uh, respect. You know, I mean, he did, he did a lot of work, but it was just in a different area um, or in, in a different way. And uh, I, I very much got into consolidation training and had him coach me through the telephone, of course. You know, he lived in California. I'm in Canada. Okay. And during that time, I was in consolidation for close to two years. And I have pictures of it. I never changed my nutrition habits. I consumed the same calories, but I was doing consolidation. Mm-hmm. And I was looking progressively worse. Well, and can I was you just elaborate on the, on the routines? I know that listeners might know what the consolidation routines are. Oh, like. yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's something really basic. Uh, 
we'll see uh, on, in one workout you might do a squat and a chimp or a pull down or a chest press. You, do, you know, you do a couple of exercises. You might even do three exercises. But uh, you do the uh, say a deadlift exercise separate from the squat workout, just so you don't have too much low back strain. The idea is that you. I, I think this is where my, Mike's philosophy came from. If intensity is as high as possible, then you need to make the volume and frequency as low as possible. Mm-hmm. So you're picking two, three, maybe four exercises and repeating them no more than once a week. And quite often, as you notice your, your strength stagnating, you would decrease the frequency. Well, I got to the point where I was training uh, those exercises once every 28 days, once a month. <laughs> and I was still able to add reps or weight or tension time every time. Now, at the same time, it's very nerve-wracking. You know, before a, a squat workout, I'd have three or four bowel movements because I was so nervous in the gut because I had to try and exceed what I did the workout before. Yeah. But, you know, all, but you got to the point where you're getting extremely strong. You're thinking, well, this has to translate into muscle. And, of course, it doesn't because for the reasons I explained before. The body coordinates. It learns how to use movement patterns. It's like little skinny guys moving furniture or moving pianos. How the hell do they do that? <laughs> well, they know how to leverage themselves and how to move it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, weight, uh, people in weight training do the same thing. They just learn without even thinking too much about it. They just they adapt and learn uh, to, to do it. And yet I was looking worse in terms of getting fatter because I was consuming the same amount of calories while exercising less. I wasn't building more muscle tissue because I had uh, uh, access to different uh, uh, bio, you know, like I had the bioanalogic body composition system. And I, of course I had measurements and my pants were getting tighter. I was getting fatter. So I had to reduce my calories. And as I was reducing my calories, I was noticing that my muscles did not have as full of a look, and I was losing that bodybuilding look. I was looking like a, not to put down power lifters, because there are some really well-built power lifters. Yeah. But if you think of the traditional power lifter where the guy's strong as hell, but if you look at him, yeah, he's kind of, kind of on the fat side. He doesn't really look athletic. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was transitioning in terms of my appearance. I was becoming uh, a power lifter without necessarily doing power lifting exercises. You know, the squat and deadlift are power lifting exercises. You know what I mean? Like, you know, a chest press or uh, doing dips or chin-ups or whatever. Uh, I was just getting more proficient at those movements and looking worse. So, you know, not to belabor that too much, uh, it got to the point where I started doing critiques on the application. And I'm talking about written critiques. I was out to our people. I didn't do that until things started falling apart between Mike and I. I, I tried to get him to do a lot more. I wanted him to produce records and photographs of his students or his, his clientele because he was talking about how this guy gained 20 pounds of muscle doing high intensity, another gained a certain amount of muscle. I said, where are these pictures? We need these pictures to put not only in our materials, but to put in our newsletter because yeah. talking about it's one thing, but actually show evidence, physical evidence will blow people away. It never happened. And when I uh, visited in California, I realized that he never even had files on his clients. Uh, he didn't even have, like, you know, journals. When you go to the gym with your clients, uh, he didn't carry any paperwork with them. He just directed them to do certain things and work out a certain way. And he may remember all their weights from previous workouts, or maybe the clients took notes. I don't know. I didn't see any of that. But the paper trail sort of ended there. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, and then when I started presenting different ideas, I wasn't into the zone training stuff at the time, but I started presenting different ideas in terms of adaptation and variation. He said, no, 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 that's all a bunch of bullshit or, you know, something along those lines. He wasn't really into it. He didn't really want to talk about it. And when I brought up training, like we're talking on the phone, he never wanted to talk about training. I rarely talked about training with him. Really? It was usually uh, something about politics or yeah, so some other aspect that had nothing to do with our business. And that's when I cut ties with them. And that's when I released my critique on the heavy duty consolidation method. And he was quite upset about that. He never responded to it. I invited him to either do an open debate or a debate in writing yeah. to validate the ideas. Um, you know, I think most people caught on to it as well. When they read the first part of his book, you know, which dealt with Ayn Rand philosophy, objectivism, People were sold on high, high uh, intensity, or at least heavy duty consolidation, what he branded as the best way to do it. And because it was, it was so logically sound, the first half of the book, that you had to presume that the training theory followed suit, and it didn't. Mm. 
It was like uh, it was almost like you cut the book in half and you could uh, read one half or the other half, and there's no connection between the two. Although he tried to make the connection, um, and even during his last little bit before he passed away, he never told me this himself. But I know people who were friends with him, good friends, and they said he was kind of coming around. He was slightly, he's slowly changing his opinion. Now, I'm not saying he would change his opinion to doing 20 sets per body part three days a week. No, I'm not <laughs> saying that. But uh, he is, he was, I think he was starting to understand that what he was suggesting wasn't quite as factual or true. And, you know, looking back at it, uh, he never trained that way himself. When, at the time that I knew him, he never exercised at all. He may have went to the gym for a couple of weeks. Well, actually, he did because uh, um, I don't want to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it very, very bluntly, but in a subtle way. I was with him when he purchased some supplements in a parking lot. And his objective was to get in really good shape to prove what consolidation could do. And I'm thinking, well, why would you need the supplements? Yeah, I mean, no one's expecting you to look like Mr. Olympia or like uh, second place Mr. Olympia like you once were or Mr. Universe. They just want to know that it produces results. And if you're going to be taking supplements, well, what's really the cause and the effect of all that? But, you know, I never said anything. And uh, he trained for two weeks while on his supplements, and then he stopped. And that has a lot to do with where he was psychologically at the time. So, you know, by and large, you know, it was a good experience because uh, I don't think any of your listeners would know who the heck I was without his intervention and him become partners with me. So, you know, uh, I definitely have to uh, give a lot of credit for that because without him, uh, I'm not sure really if I'd be known at all. You know, you, you have uh, enough trouble trying to find me on the Internet through Google search. <laughs> so you can imagine if that never happened. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate you ending on that note. Um, but no, fascinating story as well. Um, that's a good point. You know, what, the no, no website, you're a little bit of a ghost. So why is that? Why don't you, um, cause there's a lot of people that are really keen to hear what you have to say. You know, I found, I found some articles that you wrote way back in the day. Um, and if you, if it's still available, I'd love to get a, uh, to, to read your one about, uh, that you actually, the critique of Mike Mentor's consolidation routine. Is that still something that's online or is that hidden away somewhere? No, well, yeah, you know, the problem is uh, when I ran the IRT, uh, just before I sold the IRT, uh, give or take 10 years ago, you know, time passes by, I can't, I don't recall how, sure. when it was it really, um, but we'll see 10 years ago. I uh, took all the IRT materials and consolidated them, <laughs> use that word, into what I referred to as the Fit Science Library. It was a nine-volume, 5,000-page book set. And that uh, critique, of course, was part of not only one of our annual year books, it was also a part of a book, um, System Analysis. You know, so I critiqued various applications, including some high-intensity stuff, but including uh, Mel Schiff and, you know, this explosive training and kettlebell training, stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, and, but my point being is that when I saw the RT, all the rights to those materials went with it. The only way you can get those materials, I have them here, I have my own copies, of course, but uh, I can't legally give them out to people or you'd have to contact the IRT and nice. say, hey, I'm really interested in this article, do you still have the book, do you have the PDF that I can buy? Uh, otherwise, like, you know, it's there. Yeah. So what are you up to these days for, uh, from uh, like a work point of view or, you know, what we, yeah, is it just mainly personal training or what, what are you up to? Yeah, yeah it's, it's primarily personal training. Uh, I, I consider myself semi-retired only because uh, I have time to play guitar during the day. So, uh, you know, one of my, one of my passions is uh, composing music. So, you know, I play keyboards, guitar and, uh, uh, you know, rock based instrumental stuff, you know, you, you name it. So uh, that, that's what I do as a hobby. Awesome. But uh, besides my training, I'm uh, the director of education for a prescribed exercise clinic. Uh, they're out of Kingston. Uh, they are soon to be opening up another location in Toronto. Um, so they're, they're small based, but they're very much in tune with my philosophy, which is why they want me as the director of education, uh, along with Stephen Downs, who owns the clinic. And Andrew Short worked there for a while, actually. He's uh, Stephen Downs' cousin. Uh, but uh, uh, Stephen and I uh, develop materials. So if he wants materials on rotator cuff injuries, what they are, how they come about, how to rehabilitate them, and the exercises, that's what we do. 
uh, then he may want a different work module uh, or like an education module for his staff dealing with all the different ways that you can train legs and in all the various angles and how you can put this together in various programs to add variation. So he's very much into the variation aspect as well. Cool. So, you know, I, I, I do that work, again, my personal training stuff. And a lot of it is uh, rehab. I work with a clinical psycho- psychologist who will send me motor vehicle accident people. Okay. So when they get into an accident, you know, they have fear of driving, so they go to him to try and reduce anxiety, and at the same time, he gets them into uh, the training here. And I have a very good success rate with these people because, by and large, they go to they go through the, uh, the regular channels at first, you know, the physiotherapist, chiropractor, massage therapist. Uh, and there are some really good people out there, and so don't get me wrong when I say this, but by and large, a lot of physiotherapists don't know much about exercise. Mm-hmm. And they don't even use the right tools to correct a problem. So I have people who come here and they use the Medex low back and neck machine to rehabilitate, of course, low back neck injuries. Mm-hmm. If you were to go to the typical physiotherapist that's here and you say, I have a low back problem, they get you on a treadmill. Yeah, it's ridiculous. You know, so it, it's like, what the heck's going on? But that is the, the state, at least in Canada, of how physiotherapists work. And uh, I have nothing against chiropractors. Some of them are good. Something's out of place. They pop it back in. Perfect. But it doesn't change the tissue composition. You need specific direct exercise to do that. And so until that's done, the problem will keep reoccurring. Uh, and something that a lot of people don't know is that 80% of injuries will get better anyway, even without intervention. So when you have physios and some of these people working on people who do get better, they would have got better anyway. <laughs> the people who don't get better... What they're doing is not helping, and it won't help. Yeah. You know, uh, Dr. Katz, I can't remember his first name. I'm thinking of uh, the bodybuilder Mike Katz. It's not Mike Katz, but uh, his last name is spelled the same way, I believe, uh, K-A-T-Z. Okay. Oh, sorry. He's out of Montreal. And uh, this researcher looked at uh, something like 20 or 30 years of physiotherapy chiropractic studies, and he came to the following conclusion. And it did, I'm just repeating what I said. 80% of people who have injuries will get better even without intervention. 20% of the people remaining will not get better through traditional physiotherapy and chiropractic means. In other words, he's almost saying it's completely useless. <laughs> because if 80% will get better anyway, 20% are not helped by that. Yeah. Now, the other point he made is this. 80% of the 20% or remaining 20% will get better through medics uh, technology. Yeah. yeah, very underutilized. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to, um, is, is there anything else you wanted to add on to that? Sorry, in terms of like, uh, I guess what you're no, up to no, now? No, 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 it's yeah. just a, it's simply an observation that came to me and I, I thought it was an interesting point. And once again, I'm not putting down a lot of people within uh, the chiropractic industry. I, I went to a chiropractic uh, you know, office before and I had certain things corrected because I had a rib out of place or whatever. So there's value in it. I'm not saying there isn't value in it. But uh, a lot of people who have low back pain, I know a lot of people who have low back pain and it's nothing more than tight glute muscles. It has nothing to do with their low back. Yeah, which is what, they have in their... prolonged sitting or something like that? Or what do you think is causing uh, No, that? not necessarily. Uh, okay. uh, I, I had that myself. I was doing bent over T-bar rows. And if you know the leverage of a T-bar row, you put on 200 pounds in the front <laughs> and that's one heck of a pull. On the, on the, not necessarily the back, it's the glutes. Because I was very conscious about how I was positioned, the arch in the back, the chest up high, stomach pulled in. And all of a sudden, I got a sharp pain through my low back. And I was bent over. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Carol Burnett. I'm not, no. You know the comedy show? She, she has this uh, character called Miss Wiggins. And she walks sort of like bent forward with her tits out and her ass <laughs> in the other direction. So she walks like that, like this little waddle. Well, that's how I, I had to walk. I had to walk like Miss Wiggins because of the severe pain on my back. I could not straighten up. And I, was, uh, I tried to get on the low back machine, the medics machine, to try and you know, work it. And it actually got worse. Now, there, there's a reason for that because the, the glute muscles do contract even on the medics low back machine. They may not be working through a range of motion, but they do contract. And it was about a week after I had a massage therapist come in who was coming in for her own treatment. She was in a motorcycle accident. And she said, let me check this out. She never even went to my low back. She went directly to my butt, drove her elbow in there, and it took about 10 minutes of severe pain and it finally popped. And I was completely okay. 
And that told me, I wonder how many low back problems are associated with just tight glutes or spasms in the glutes. Yeah. And by and large, probably um, 90% of my clients who may not have a low back problem, but all of a sudden they did. Oh, my low back gave up. Oh, it hurts. It hurts. And then I'll get them uh, on the floor on a tennis ball, just rolling around and working the glute. And eventually it releases. Uh-huh. And, you know, they weren't going to come in because they thought they hurt their back. They were going to call, call a chiropractor. They're going to call their doctor. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just uh, tight glute muscles. And that's actually more common than a lot of people realize uh, with athletes because they are, the glutes are the strongest muscle in the body. They're the most used and abused in athletics. And athletes, I didn't realize this at the time, but, uh, you, know, you know, athletes worth a lot of money will have constant massages, especially in the glutes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that's increased in, in popularity since this kind of, since this has become more common knowledge. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, you know, becoming more popular with the, the glute uh, spasms or the, the knowledge of it. <laughs> the knowledge of it, I suppose, that you could. Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I probably, probably both is correct because you have more people today exercising than ever. Although, you know, we have a society of obesity. But in terms of, you know, you look back in the 1960s, very few people exercised. And a lot more people are doing it. And uh, you have a lot more people doing really crazy things. You know, I consider CrossFit to be one of those crazy things meant for a 20-year-old, not for a 4-year or 50-year-old. Uh, and they do things to really emphasize the use of the glutes. And now you have all these young girls who want to uh, overdevelop the glutes because of Kardashian or uh, <laughs> whoever, you know what I mean, because they want that big butt look. So they're, they're doing like a lot of lunges, a lot of deep squats, and a lot of things to emphasize glute development you know it's all these things you know what i mean yeah. uh that come into play and it's, it's, a, it's an overused muscle and if people understood uh how the fascia works which is uh, you know that layer between uh, the muscle and the skin sure. and it actually covers more area of the body than the skin does because it also envelops all our organs you start getting tight areas in that fascia it affects something that's like 12 inches or you know 30 centimeters distal from where the problem is it's worse than spasms that actually has a bigger covering area when you have tight fascia uh, and uh, yeah i think that's why all, you know, you're also seeing a lot more emphasis of uh those massage rollers massage balls uh people need to use those a lot more often the more active they are the more often that you need to use those and uh, it's interesting because um paolo gentile who's a um a researcher down in uh, South America. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Um, he he does these funny videos on his Facebook um, with women doing. Uh, you tend to be very very attractive, um, shapely women who uh, look like they're probably in the pursuit of what you were just saying. You know, bigger butts, um, and they're doing all sorts of insane lunges and like squats and things that just look really biomechanically all over the place. And he does these funny videos that break it down in terms of like the, the biomechanics and the science and explain why it's ineffective or dangerous um and they're just they're just funny to watch so i'll uh, i'll link that in the show notes for people that want to see that um okay. just wanted to uh, ask you some questions about nutrition quickly brian because i know uh, time's yeah, sure. time's ticking um well you mentioned obviously you hinted at it earlier you don't you're not a huge fan of the kind of low carb uh craze that's i guess going around at the moment uh and you do think that carbs have a place so what what, what is your view on diet and what do you recommend you know let's take your client you know a model client example for you who might be you know a advanced trainee who wants to put on uh more muscle using your protocols like what kind of diet dietary advice do you give in that respect well uh, you know i uh... Unless you're on some steroids, I really don't see a value in really high protein diets. You know, at least in terms of think you know, I need more protein to build more muscle. The body's only going to build so much muscle. And even people on steroids, if they put on 20 pounds of muscle, 70 percent of it's water, right? So how much protein do you really need? Uh, so you know, my, my uh, philosophy on eating is to try to eat as natural and as raw as possible. I'm not talking about raw meat. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're living next to a farm and you can go uh, slaughter a cow and grab a steak and bring it home, fine, eat it. Uh, but, uh, a lot of places do not have close access to farms. So you ne- never know, know how long the meat's been sitting there. Uh, raw eggs are not even a good idea because the protein is too hard to digest. You need to, uh, boil them for like maybe a minute mm. just till they turn like a gel. If you do have, uh, eggs more on the raw side, and that way you also uh, kill, uh, the bacteria that's in them. 
Um, but I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, dark green leafy vegetables, uh, dark berries, uh, nuts, nut butter, seeds, things on those lines. Try to uh, hemp powder or hemp seeds. You know, if you're going to have pasta, you're better off having like a quinoa-based pasta as opposed to a wheat pasta. You know, I, I don't think too many people should be eating wheat products or dairy products. They increase inflammation in the body. Mm-hmm. That's been a known fact for years. You know, it increases water retention as a result. That's why anyone who stops uh, eating wheat or uh, dairy, they'll drop, you know, five, six pounds in a week, and they think they lost fat. All they did was flush water out of their body for because the inflammation is reduced. All right. So, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any, uh, yeah, I have a very general philosophy uh, when it comes to nutrition because you have some people who can't stand green vegetables. So we'll uh, buy uh, a powdered green mix, if you know what I'm talking about, like a green powder, where it's like you get 10 servings of vegetables uh, concentrated in the powder. Oh, yeah. Don't they do uh, like uh, athletic greens, do something like that? Or, uh, I think. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not a big vegetable eater either. If my uh, fiance uh, makes vegetables or my mother does, I'm having dinner over there. Oh, that's fine. I'll eat them. But I'm not one to go out in a grocery store and buy a bunch of vegetables. Yeah. You know, I'd rather just have the green powder. Yeah. Because <laughs> I can mix it in a glass and I drink it, you know, and I don't have to worry about it. You know, the bulk of my diet, uh, I don't even eat that much meat. I have meat maybe twice a week. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, sort of loosely a vegetarian, if you want to call me that, mm. uh, part-time vegetarian. Uh, so it's, it's mostly, uh, you know, flax, uh, powder, uh, sunflower seeds, uh, cashews. Like I'll, I'll, I really go heavily after the, the nuts and seed aspect of, uh, my nutrition. Uh, one, the, one supplement I do take on a regular basis I find really helps is, uh, desiccated liver tablets. All right. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. I, I, I find it just, uh, maybe it's the iron level in them that makes you feel better, makes you feel a little more alert and uh, awake. But, uh, that seems to be like a, a typical supplement of mine, but I don't, uh, uh, take a large pro- amounts of protein powders or any anything like that. What is that? Can you just give us like a typical day's eating? Like what that looks like in terms of different meals and spacing and that kind of thing. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, in the morning, I may have oatmeal because my fiance likes it, and if I'm sleeping over at her place, and you know, we have two different places, uh, I'll <laughs> eat it. So I'm not against that, and you know that's not a like a really great thing to eat. So I'll have a very small bowl of that. So uh, whether or not you want to count that, that's fine. Um, but, uh, late morning is my biggest meal. I will, uh, if you want to get ready for this, I'll, uh, take some, uh, hemp seeds, hemp powder, fl- uh, flax seed powder, uh, some uh, poppy seeds and some chia seeds. Uh, and I'll put that in a bowl. So it's all dried stuff. Then I will add a little bit of maple syrup for liquid and it gives a little bit of sweetness. So there's some carb right there. Of course, the other things have carbohydrate in them. Uh, then I'll, uh, to muck it up, I'll add almond butter, natural peanut butter, and uh, sesame seed po- uh, um, butter. So I'll make this into a big muck. <laughs> if you want to yeah. call that in a bowl. Yeah. And it, it, it must be like uh, 1,500 calories. It, it has to be. I, I, I never measured it, but uh, I'll eat that, and I won't eat probably for like five hours, six hours. It just stays with you because it takes such a long time to digest. But it doesn't cause a, a lot of gas because, you know, with a lot of nuts, you have to chew them a lot to break down into the small pieces, mm-hmm. whereas I'm eating things that are already powdered or uh, put into a butter format. Mm-hmm. So uh, I find it stays with you a long time. It takes a long time to digest. Mid to late afternoon, uh, if I do eat something, it might be along the lines of uh, some egg whites with two eggs, and I'll throw in greens on top of that. I don't eat greens that much, but I'll throw it in there. Uh, and I'll cook that with, you know, turmeric and various spices. Turmeric's really good for you. It reduces uh, stress levels in the body and inflammation. Yeah. So uh, as, as one of those. Uh, of course, you have to mix it with black pepper, or else it doesn't uh, get initiated in the body. A lot of people don't know that. Does that make it more bioavailable or something like that? Yes, yeah. Right, okay. And, oh, yeah, and even with my nut butter, I'll add uh, ginger and cinnamon uh, to it. Nice. Quite a bit. I'm talking about maybe uh, one and a half to two grams each of uh, that, so that it has a medicinal effect yeah. as opposed to just uh, giving a bit of flavor. So I might have those eggs in the afternoon. Uh, then at dinner time, uh, it could be a large salad. Uh, once again, I'm not into vegetables, but I'll eat the salad, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I'll have the, the salad, and again, I'll start mixing things to make it uh, uh, heavier in calories and more nutritious. Like uh, I'll put in a, an avocado, 
along with uh, you know either olive oil or avocado oil, and then along with all the other various spices, and have a piece of lean chicken on top of that. Okay. And besides those meals, I'll have the three or four desiccated liver tablets three or four times a day. Every single day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but you know, if I'm uh, going on a holiday or a trip, I don't carry all this crap with me. You know, I just deviate from it and I eat whatever I feel like having or whatever's available at the time. So I'm not, uh, you know, some people are really, uh, they're sticklers with their diet and they're car- car- carting along their supplements on uh, their vacations or if they're going on a weekend. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I've never, I, I don't believe in that because, you know, I like variation in my diet as well. So it doesn't bother me to have a hamburger and fries, uh, you know, while I'm on vacation and not having my liver tablets. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I don't see any difference in my physique when I do that. Do you, yeah, no, sure. Do you, um, yeah, so I was going to ask you that. Do you, do you eat, will you eat like junk food like at all? Or, I mean, how regularly do you think you might have a, you know, sort of cheat meal, so to speak? I know is whiskey considered junk food. <laughs> um, I don't know because it depends on uh, depends on what it's with. <laughs> if it's with coke or something, I imagine you have a, perhaps have it neat, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you know, I, I drink alcohol probably once a week, twice at most. So I usually just once a week. I'll uh, yeah. designate a day to say, okay, I'm going to relax and have a few drinks. Um, Junk food. Um, well, you know, if uh, there has to be chocolate someplace, I might have a piece of chocolate. Um, I don't buy it. Even even dark chocolate. You know, dark chocolate is good for you, but uh, you know, I, I just don't really uh, buy uh, that too much. Uh, potato chips I might have once a year. <laughs> you know, the thing is, that the um, the the healthier you eat, the more naturally you eat, the less desire you have for things that are junky. And when you do eat them, you feel like shit. Oh yeah, completely agree with that. Yeah, you just don't yeah. feel good. You know, it's, it's not it's the processed food. You know, like, uh, you know, last week I had a uh, hamburger and fries at a restaurant, and it, t- it tasted fine. And I always load up my fries with salt because if I'm going to have fries, I'm going to put a lot of salt on them because I don't add salt to anything, which is weird. You know, if you don't add salt to anything, why would you do it to fries? But I just like the taste. And so you know, you're bloated out for two days. And you're drinking gallons of water. You're not even going to the bathroom because it's all <laughs> retained in your body. Totally. And then you have the buns on the burger, which uh, is processed, processed flour. So, you know, you do that and it's like you don't even want to look at that stuff for uh, several weeks. You know? yeah. Now, I can, you might be able to relate to this, um, but yesterday I had this big, I had like a, a cheese toasty thing uh, at a restaurant. Um, and then straight after, I had this big chocolate sundae with huge bits of honeycomb in it. Um, and I was complete asshole for like two hours after that or two, three hours because I was so... So I was out with my girlfriend and we were out just in, in town. Um, and just... I was not a nice... Uh, not a pleasant person to be around <laughs> and uh, I, I and she she knows because she's obviously experienced this before we've been together for a long time she's like it's the sugar you're in a sugar grump she's saying and i'm like i'm t- I, I hate the fact that it's true so i'm like in denial you know <laughs> but it really i find i find where i you know five six days a week i will eat really really well what i consider to be well you know whole food type diet um I, I I find I like you're saying I'm so much more sensitive to bad food when I do eat it versus someone who's eating badly almost every day they're not really perhaps they're more resilient to it or they're just not they don't feel that much different they just feel kind of crappy all the time I don't know but well, yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, that, that's a good point when it comes to your, you're talking about way earlier about uh, how do you judge the value of a workout. If you have yeah. someone with about 10% body fat, they're not ripped or anything, but, you know, they're lean. You can see each individual muscle and you can see the abs and, you know, the separation of the shoulder from the, the arms and all that. When you have some crappy workouts or if you eat crappy, you can visually see it. It's, it's obvious. Something is not quite right. I mean, you could even be overtrained. You're, you know, whether you have these crappy workouts or overtraining or eating poorly, you can see it. But if you have enough of a camouflage, a body fat on you, you cannot determine what, uh, well, whether you're having good workouts or not, or whether you're eating poorly or not, because you always look kind of iffy. And of course, you have people who are really overweight. Well, they look like crap all the time. And like you said, do they feel like crap all the time? 
Well, you know, and it always makes me wonder. Uh, I have days where I'm, I'm tired. I'm not sure if you get that. You know, I'm 52. Uh, maybe that has something to do with it. But I know other people who are pretty energetic at 52. But uh, a lot of times they feel tired even after having a, a full night's sleep. And I'm sort of like sluggish. You, know, you have your yeah. couple cups of coffee to get things going. And then you see these people who are 400 pounds walking around with an ice cream cone and laughing and shopping and doing everything else. And you're thinking, what the heck's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, Shouldn't you... they be feeling like shit all the time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I know what you mean, actually. I, um, I, it's hard to say, isn't it, when you do have those days where you, you do feel quite tired. You're like, you're like, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm, I'm pretty, I'm in my head quite a lot, which is uh, not always good. And I'm very analytical, so I'm constantly thinking, okay, what did I do yesterday? Or what did I do earlier today or a few days ago that may have triggered this tiredness now? Um, and uh, sometimes I think, you know, I, I've certainly been drinking a lot of coffee lately. I've probably had maybe two or three cups every morning, almost every day for as long as I can remember, probably about a month and a half, something like that. And um, I know that some people have a view that if you're drinking a fair amount of coffee, that it can make you far less sensitive to the effects of things like caffeine and that can then have other negative effects like maybe making you tired later on in the day so i figured oh maybe that's you know related to that but it's really hard to say i mean unless you start doing controlling all your variables and <laughs> doing sort of self-experimentation yeah. it's I, I, yeah I, i'm i do find that stuff like that difficult because like i have a quite a i try and make my life pretty interesting and varied and it's difficult to do n equals one without being a total bore sometimes you know so <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and I know where you're coming from in terms of the gears turning in your head, and I tend to have that at nighttime. I'll oh, go to yeah. the bathroom at two. You know, you can barely get to the bathroom at two in the morning because you know you're just sort of staggering, bumping into things. You you go, <laughs> you lay down in bed, all of a sudden your eyes are wide awake, and you, and the gears start turning in terms of what you have to do the next day, and uh, you're on a particular project that you're working on, and when you when are you going to be done that? And yeah, you start breaking down things so much, and uh, the heads working so hard that yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get back to sleep yeah that's fascinating that you bring that up because i'm i've been going through that actually the last few days like wake up in the night go for a you know go for a wee and then uh, come back and just lay there and i'm i've recently uh moved country i lived in uh, london in the uk and uh, just over a month ago i moved to galway in ireland <laughs> of all places um because my girlfriend's irish so we we for a number of reasons we decided to move over um and with that i left a career in it sales um which was you know good good job good income uh, and decided to focus on corporate warrior full time um and you know increase the, the the you know grow the business and increase the revenues and, and make that a, a full-time gig um so i'll do that i'll you know i'll come back to bed and i'll lay there and i'll just be thinking about i'll be inspired i'll be thinking about all the ideas and things i'm working on and uh and, and just want to start the next day already you know what i mean like don't even right. want to go to sleep yeah. so yeah i i have been trying to switch that off with doing a little bit more like um uh, like more fiction reading and I, well, I don't really meditate at the, at the moment, but it's something I've experimented with, but I, yeah, I am trying to figure out ways to kind of unplug, so to speak, like no screen Saturdays, like trying to leave the phones at home on like a Saturday if I'm, you know, right, out yeah. with family or something like that. So yeah. I don't know. Have you got any advice for, I guess, <laughs> on that at all? Or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know what? When I uh, ran the IRT, I was doing 12 hour days, seven days a week. It's Jeez. rarely I took a holiday. When I did take a holiday, I tried to make it a work holiday. So I would <laughs> go down to visit Mike Menser to conduct business, but spend, you know, three or four days in California. So uh, I, I always took care of two birds with one stone. Uh, and uh, after I forget how many years of doing that, how long I ran it, it must have been around 10, 12 years that I had the IRT. And uh, I was looking forward to selling it. Because uh, marking the exams, creating the materials, constantly answering emails, it is just completely saps your energy. And uh, that was the worst time at night in terms of the wheel spinning. I'd be up at, I'd be wide awake at 2 o'clock, I went and did some computer work. I'd be working on a book, so I thought, I'm awake, I got some good ideas, I'm going to get them down, so I'd do that. Yeah. And I did that for 12 years. I, I think that's just the nature of the person who's doing it, you know, in terms of advice of how to not, not to do it. Uh, you know, that it's really difficult, especially when you're trying to get to sleep at night. I try to think of something very mundane. Uh, and I keep thinking about something really boring or stupid. And I keep repeating my head and it tends to put me to sleep rather than thinking of something that's interesting or something that I want to think about. 
You know, it's it's almost like the counting sheep situation. (laughs) Oh, I get you. Yeah, I have I have stuff like that, like little uh, stories and narratives I I I go to actually, which work quite well. So I I get what you mean when you say that. Uh, That's interesting. Um. Cool. Okay. So, um, appreciate that time is ticking, Brian. And I want to be obviously respectful of your, of your time, but I just want to ask you some final questions. Sure, um, yeah. Hmm. Right. Here we go. So what, um, I guess talking about books, we've talked about books a little bit, but, um, what, what books have you reread the most yourself on ex- I suppose talking about exercise and nutrition specifically? Uh, I don't recall ever rereading anything twice. Oh, Never Just, read it. The, 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 the odd time I actually uh, reread a couple of things I wrote because I forgot what I wrote, and I said, oh, there's an interesting point. You know, I, I forgot, actually forget what I write. Uh, you know, because uh, over the years I probably did about six thousand pages worth of materials. So, and I try to make everything as unique as possible. So I can't remember even what the heck I wrote. But uh, yeah, as soon as I read something, I, I you know, I, my library keeps getting small as soon as I read something I get rid of the book I never go back to it uh, the only uh, non-fiction book I think I read most than one, more than once was uh, In Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand and I, I also read her uh, the Principles of Objectivism book uh, a couple of times but uh, other than that I don't recall anything hmm. you know, if I read something I, I get it you know what I mean yeah. And uh, what, what, what I used to do, I don't do this much anymore, uh, maybe due to laziness, who knows. Uh, but when I read a book, I always uh, wrote out or typed out sections that I thought were fascinating. So it might be a 500-page book, but I'll have five or six sentences that really struck me. And I'll record those. And so I have like a filing cabinet of various topics or whatever, where I uh, just get those key points down that I ever want to refer to them again, or, you know, maybe two years later, say, oh, what's this paper about? And then I'll read the points. Oh, yeah, that was really interesting. So it just sort of reminds me of uh, what I thought was the most important aspects of that particular book, rather than having to read the darn book all over again. You know, life's too short to have to involve yourself in repetitive tasks when you can just get the highlights, you know, the more or less the cliff notes or the Coles notes. Mm. No, that's, that, that's good advice. Um, I guess these are, these are kind of more, these ones I'm asking now, more kind of rapid fire in terms of, I will ask them in a rapid fire way, but obviously your answers can be uh, as long winded as you like. Um, what's okay. the, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Come back to um, me if you need to park it. <laughs> yeah, yeah geez, I'm trying to think of uh, all the things that people have told me over the years. Um, I know Arthur, uh, I t- talked to Arthur Jones a few times, and he said things along the lines of, uh, don't trust the government. Uh, if you think they're helping you, they're not. And that, by and large, is about uh, one of the most important things worldwide that we can consider. Especially, you know, you left London. You know what was going on with London? You know what's going on with Paris and everywhere else. Yeah. And government, governments are controlled by the people with the money, the big banks, the, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds. And these people are in it for their own good. And there's a reason why the migration situation is occurring the way it is. It's to take over the Western civilization in terms of the, our values and who we are as, a, as people. And they're trying. They're, they're simply flooding it because they have an agenda. I'm not going to go through the whole conspiracy thing. You know, you probably heard all that stuff before, anyway. But you know, by and large, that's true. Anyone who runs for government for office, uh, they they have an ego. They're it's a power trip. They they got uh, their pension when they retire after only serving uh, a few years. So very. I'm sure there's some good politicians out there. I'm not saying there isn't, but by and large. Uh, uh, that has, uh, has an effect in terms of the government not working for you, working for themselves for their own power and money. And if you look at everyday life, that's pretty much what it's like. People will help you for uh, reasons of selfishness. No one's, uh, very few people ever in the world ever sacrifice. You sacrifice and you give up a higher value for a lesser value. No one does that. So um, it, people do things because there's something in it for them. You know, I'm doing this interview. You're not paying me for this interview, so why would I give this interview? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I'm doing it for ego reasons, just like everyone else you've interviewed. They think they have something to share. They think they're pretty hot stuff. And uh, they get their ego stroked because they're being interviewed. Not everyone gets interviewed in the world. Only select people. 
So, you know, I'm doing it for a reason. Uh, a lot of other people do reasons uh, or do things because of money, because of power. And if you consider that there's always a motive behind everyone's actions, mm. do, then do you you'll not, get a lot further in life. Do you not think, um, see, I, 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 well, I think I might look at it slightly differently because, um, you know, I think that, well, you know, a lot of my guests' intentions, that's not, I mean, maybe I could be wrong, but it's not ego-driven. It's often they have something they want to share to help people, and they know that. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but don't, yeah. Don't, don't, don't they feel good about sharing that information? So that is the, well, that is the virtue of selfishness, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But, they, they feel good about it. But it's, it's, it, it, strokes, it strokes them. Yeah, I suppose. But and, and, and there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's something wrong right. with that. Uh, someone who's very altruistic might think, "Oh, there's oh, that's terrible. That's terrible." But everyone <laughs> does something for a reason, and it's to either keep a value or uh, obtain a higher value. Yeah, I see. No, I, I um, yeah, I hear what you're saying, um, and yeah, I, I think. I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing, though. That uh, you know, we we by being compassionate, it, it's a it's a there's a feel good response to that. Uh, I've not well, actually. It, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly because uh, a lot of good in the world may not happen if it wasn't for the feel good response. Yeah. Because uh, why would you help someone who made you feel bad? <laughs> you <know? laughs> or, or you had right. zero feelings about it. Right. You know, you wouldn't even consider doing it because you had zero feelings about it. Uh, you know, it's like uh, giving uh, a street beggar on the street 50 cents. What the heck's 50 cents to you? But uh, that person is, it might be quite a bit. Uh, but you gave them that 50 cents because the, uh, it made you feel better. The value of uh, making you feel better, feel good about yourself, was a higher value than the 50 cents. Oh, I see. Now, if it was $1,000, would you hand that person 1000 bucks? You're bullshit. This is my 1000 bucks. The, 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 I have a greater value in this thousand bucks than you getting a meal. Go find your meal somewhere else. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, to put it bluntly, you know, yeah. that's the way it is. Yeah. You do things because there's something in it for you. What about you know, when I, someone I had breaks a, that trend and they do that? They just go and give their thousand dollars to you. The... That's because it made them feel better than the value of a thousand bucks. There's oh, something so. that made them. There, there's a higher value of saying, you know what, this thousand bucks means more to that person to me, and that makes me feel good. All right. Okay. Now, if someone had a gun to your head and said, "You better give that thousand bucks to that other person," then you're you're kind of sacrificing, but not really, because the value of your life, because you're the guns at your head, it means more to you than the thousand bucks. Right. So it's very difficult to pick out when has a person ever sacrificed him or herself. It's very difficult to find an example of it. Well, true selflessness, I suppose, is 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 what you're saying, right? It's, it's difficult to find examples of that. Is that what you're saying? Is that, uh, is that the right word? Or? No, uh, no, no. Uh, it's difficult to find an example of a sacrifice. Right. Okay. Where you, where you give up a higher value for a lesser value. Okay. I always thought that was selflessness, though, in a way. No? What a sacrifice? Get, well, if you're being selfless, and my, 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 certainly my, my understanding of that is if you're doing something with no, you're doing something to help someone else, but with no gain to yourself. But I guess there yeah, is. But a, the, the, yeah, but who, who doesn't feel good about that? Yeah, I get it. It's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, I can't think of an example of someone who has actually sacrificed something. You know, and a lot of this comes from uh, the Catholic religion when God gave his only son, he sacrificed his only son for the sins of others. There's an example of sacrifice because you're giving something of a higher value, the perfect human being, for a lesser value, a bunch of scum who's committing sin, <laughs> which is really irrational, doesn't even make sense. Yeah. That's like, you know, I'm not sure if you have kids. It's like uh, sacrificing one of your kids, like uh, taking a knife and uh, killing your kid because it will, uh, you know, on behalf of the sins of other people. It doesn't make sense. But, you know, I don't want to get into religion. But, but you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like to try, to try and discover uh, 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 someone who sacrificed something is it, very difficult. But uh, in every instance, or just about every instance, uh, everyone's being selfish in terms of their actions. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because, you know, there's just being, uh, uh, being selfish and feeling good about doing things or whatever do something for yourself and being self-centered mm. i imagine where you don't really give it sorry go on no you know it's at the point where you are doing things for your own self-interest without considering the the values or the uh uh the rights of other individuals 
So that that's a difference. You know, that's not uh, being selfish. That's being self-centered. That's being uh, uh, um, uh, hedonistic. You know, what have you? Yeah, I imagine. I mean, I'm guessing a lot of this is explored in something like the virtue of selfishness, because I've never read it. Um, uh, oh yeah, exactly. and it's not a very big book. It's only a hundred and some pages. You know, but it's like uh, very uh, dense in terms of the concepts and principles and. Uh, it, it's amazing. Like, uh, I had my mother read it one time. You know, she was looking for something to read, so it was a small book, and she read it. She says, wow, does that ever make sense? And she stopped using the words uh, uh, about someone being selfish. She stopped saying that. Yeah. See, so, yeah, we're all being selfish. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, I, it's, uh, it's something I, I, I definitely need to read. Um, okay, so... As I said, I want to be respectful of your time, your time, Brian. So um, we will we will shortly end. And what's the the best way for people to find out more about you at the moment? As we were talking about, you're a bit of a ghost on the interweb. So <laughs> what's what's the best way for people to find out more about you and, and contact you if if that's something you're open to? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't have a website, and that's because I'm selfish. <laughs> it's not because I can't put the, I can't you know I can put together a website and have PayPal and sell stuff, uh, but I value my downtime away from the business aspect because I'm not, uh, I'm not hurting for money. You know, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm saving money for retirement and I'm living okay. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have car payments. So things are paid off. Uh, so I value that free time to investigate other things in my life as opposed to just trying to make more money. So the value of my free time is more than the, uh, the money. But if someone wants a book, I will sell them something. And quite often I, I'm limited to PDFs or maybe some DVDs because I, I don't print off books. I do hardcover books and they're expensive to produce, uh, especially when you only do like a dozen. And that, that was a point I made way back at the beginning of the interview when uh, the, the latest book I uh, did, uh, Advanced Bodybuilding Strategies and yeah. Methods, uh, you know, it's over a hundred bucks to produce one or like, or less than a dozen. Each one is a hundred and some dollars. As soon as you start producing more than it's cheaper and it gets, you know, down to about maybe 30, 40 bucks or whatever, you make a thousand of them, but you're sitting on them, right? Yeah. Uh, but to answer your uh, question, if people wish to email me and, uh, I don't mind, uh, saying hi to people or maybe answering a very basic question, but I don't want people to inundate me with questions unless they want to set up, uh, an actual consultation. Okay. Because I don't want to invest uh, you know, a couple of hours with someone just to sort of help them out uh, because I'm selfish with my time. So, <laughs> uh, so if, they, if people do want to contact me, my email is logic, L-O-G-I-C, B like boy, D like Donald, J like John. So logic, B-D-J, okay. at hotmail.com. Cool. Um, and yeah, and I guess with that, obviously we, we spoke about this before, but if, if there are any questions that the listeners have um, that you'd like to submit, do so, please do so on the blog. Um, and you can find this episode and all episodes on corporatewarrior.org. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C O R P warrior.com, and enter your email address. Then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you'll be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. 